Hello friends, this is Fiction Domain. How are you all? So we are back with second part of what if Naruto gained the ultimate power of destruction. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this. Then be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Sakura panted as she dodged Kamizuki Suzum's blow. The spar, as always, was far more intense than any of the workouts she had gotten during her regular training. In addition to her daily training with Team 7 and the D-rank mission she was now grateful for after having experienced a C-rank and seeing how badly missions could go wrong once one left Kanoha's gates, she trained with Suzum three afternoons a week when the other girl wasn't on missions. Naruto had introduced them to each other shortly after she had asked him what she would need to do in order to prepare for the Chunin exams when they returned to Kanoha back in April, several weeks after she had come to the epiphany that her life, whichever course it ended up taking, could only begin after she passed the Chunin exams. She remembered the look on Naruto's face when he'd asked her if she was serious. That look of shock and incredulity that had crossed the boy's face had hurt. Had she really acted as if she hadn't taken being a ninja seriously so much that when she finally wanted to do something above and beyond what she had been doing, she was met with surprise and disbelief. Sure, she had spent an inordinate amount of time on the pursuit of her future husband, but she had still studied and trained. Apparently not enough however, as the mission in Wave and her training with Naruto's former teammate clearly illustrated. But, she had trained nonetheless. Eventually, after taking several blows her training session with Suzu mended and both girls parted ways. She had learned from Naruto that Suzum's goal was to start her own dojo after she retired from the shinobi forces and she believed the girl could do it. Not only was Suzum skilled in the martial arts, but she was a good teacher and she could also see why Naruto liked her so much because she was a good and kind of somewhat strict person as well. After parting ways with Suzum, she headed home for dinner. When she arrived, her mom was in the kitchen preparing the meal which, much to her relief, seemed to be traditional fare rather than one of her frequent experiments this evening. Sometimes, her mother's kitchen experiments were appreciated, but most often, they were not. After inspecting the evening meal and finding it to be edible, she went upstairs to shower and change, and when she came down, dinner was ready. So, how was your day? Her mother asked her when everyone was settled at the table. Her father tried to look interested in her reply, but had grown so used to years of girl talk since he was completely outnumbered in that area that he automatically tuned everything out. She could tell that he was tuning her out again because her dad's eyes had that slightly glazed over look that said, I'll nod at appropriate intervals so I don't end up on the couch, otherwise, I'm not listening. Training went better than usual as it's been going since Asu quit trying to pick fights with Naruto. They still don't seem to like each other but at least they're not arguing. She started as she picked up her rice bowl. Our mission today was walking dogs, it wasn't so bad. There was a rather funny incident where a dog that was almost the size of a horse tried to pull Kakashi Sensei's arms out of their sockets. She continued before taking a bite of her rice, which fortunately didn't have any exotic spices added to it this evening. After the mission, I trained with Suzum san for a bit. I don't see why you hang out with that girl. Her mother said disapprovingly. Someone who spends that much time with that Yuzumaki boy isn't. Isn't what mother? Suzum is a loyal shinobi of Konoha and Achunin. She said, upset that her mother was harping on that again. She has volunteered to train me when she could be occupying what little free time she has with something more worthwhile out of the kindness of her heart. But still. Her mother started. She sighed. She loved her mother, but there were times when the woman could be absolutely trying. She wasn't going to stop hanging out with Suzum. Suzum was helping her get ready to pass the Chunin exams when she took them next year, end of discussion. Lamachi's abuser shifted uncomfortably as he waited in the Mizukage's office, more than two months after he'd been captured by that team from Kanoha, and less than a week after Kanoha had turned him over to Kiri. Practically the instant the Godin had been selected, the Hokage had shipped him back to Kiri with an admonition of don't let us catch you again. Instead of being immediately executed as he had expected to be upon arrival, he had been brought to meet with the Godin Mizukage, whoever he was. After what had been an interminable wait, the door to the room finally opened, and a very familiar woman with exceedingly long auburn hair and green eyes, who was dressed in rather revealing clothing walked in. Instead of announcing the Mizukage's imminent arrival, the woman calmly walked across the room and seated herself at the desk that had once belonged to Yugura and whoever that asshole who had been controlling him had been. He'd liked Yugura before he became Mizukage and had only reluctantly decided to kill him and take his place to end the bloodshed his rule had caused. The idea of being Mizukage himself hadn't been all that bad either, Mizukage Mamachi had a rather nice ring to it and he probably would have succeeded in his endeavor despite the Sambi if the jerk who had been pulling Yugura's strings hadn't interfered. He was sharply pulled out of his musings about what had happened the last time he'd set foot in this office by a sudden realization. Mei was the Mizukage. 
Mei was a few years older than him, and he'd dated her a couple of times, so he knew that she was the sort of woman who was very capable at whatever she set her mind to, but Mizukij. Most of my current advisors have advised me to have you publicly executed to further cement my position. The new Mizukij said. You seem to have a great deal of popular support and would therefore be a threat to me. I am not about to hand over my new hat so soon after I got it, and you know full well that if it came down to a fight, I would win. May continued, leaning forward slightly as she shifted position, and probably rather deliberately giving him a better view of her cleavage. I am always in need of capable advisors. May said, shifting back to a less revealing position. That is why I came up with a solution that would satisfy both of us and some of the traditionalists who don't believe a woman should be in power as well. Should you refuse my offer or attempt to take my position, I will be forced to kill you, and that is something I would seriously regret, especially considering our friendship. It was at that point that the new Mizukij opened a drawer of her desk, pulled out a small velvet box, and tossed it to him. He caught it and cautiously opened it, hoping that it wasn't trapped or something. What was inside was a trap, but not one in the traditional sense. It was a gold ring. He now had two choices. Accept the offer it represented, or die. Congratulations, Zabuza Sama. Haku said before he could give his answer. It had been the angered yells that had drawn Naruto's attention while he had been wandering the village with no destination in particular, since he couldn't think of anything else to do since he'd finished his training for the day and hadn't been in the mood to sit still with a book. When he arrived at the site of the confrontation which was taking place on the road just inside the main gate that had attracted his notice, it had been to see Satoshi being attacked by someone from the arriving Suna delegation, who was dressed in an outfit that resembled the costume of a Benraku puppeteer. The Benraku boys' teammates and Jounin sensei held back to remain with the boy, while the main group which seemed to consist of eight or nine other teams made their way past them and to the administration complex. He could easily guess why Satoshi had been attacked, because it was almost always the reason why Satoshi ended up being involved in fights these days. He'd gotten caught swiping something. Damn it Satoshi. He yelled as he moved to aid the Chunin. How many times have you been told not to steal from our allies? Sorry about that. He said to the members of the Suna team when he arrived. Satoshi hears a bit of a kleptomaniac. It's okay. The Jounin replied with an amused smile. Kankuro here needed a lesson on why hiding his more valuable possessions is a good idea. As he and the Suna Jounin conversed, several Chunin who had apparently been alerted to the confrontation by the gate guards broke the fight up and from the looks of things, Satoshi would be spending at least a week in jail. It would probably be good for him. Tetsuo Sensei was always saying that he needed something to shake him up and teach him his lesson. Jail and a black mark on his record probably wouldn't be enough however, which was a pity since, despite his compulsion to steal anything and everything, Satoshi was a very good ninja. He'd hate to see him dismissed from the ranks over something like this. How about I show you a shortcut to the administration complex so you can get signed in and afterward I'll show you where the best places to eat are. He said after Satoshi had been hauled away, hoping to soothe relations between them and Kanoha a bit. Thank you. The Jounin said. I really don't want us to be too much trouble though. No trouble at all. He replied. I didn't have anything else to do this evening, and Satoshi used to be my teammate until he got promoted, so it's the least I can do. As he followed the blonde boy's lead, Gara studied the boy named Naruto, wondering what the boy had done to earn such antipathy from the civilian population. When he'd first noticed the stares of the villagers, he had thought that they had been directed at him and had a great deal of difficulty in not killing the people outright, as mother called for their blood. If he had done so, the plan that had been put in place by his father and the village elders would be ruined and they would be forced to flee. While he personally didn't care if that happened, the results of his ruining his father's plans would cause more irritation than they were worth as he would never hear the end of it. And, if he killed father in order to shut him up, he would never hear the end of that either, even if he eliminated the entire population of Suna. Mother would most likely bring it up to annoy him and mother wasn't going anywhere. It was when he heard the comments that he realized that the cold stares from the civilians weren't directed at him, but at their guide through the village instead. How could the cheerful boy who was currently guiding them to his favorite restaurant on their way their new quarters ignore all of that? How could he go day to day listening to that and not want to kill the people around him? He wanted to kill them after less than five minutes. Heck, he'd wanted to kill them after less than five seconds. Without seeming to want anything in return, the boy named Naruto had offered to show them around. Not Kankuro, not Tamari, not Baki, all of them. He knew that the boy couldn't have failed to notice the fear with which his siblings and teammates had regarded him, but despite that, the boy had still treated him with the same kindness as he had the others. Even though he felt hesitation because of this, there was still the question over whether or not the boy was strong enough that killing him would validate his existence, mother was. Uncertain about him. 
As the boy led the way to the restaurant ignoring the stares and comments along the way he nattered on about some team who had been throwing snowballs during the Chunin exams in Kiri a year and a half ago. Tamari, Kankuro, and Baki found this story very amusing for some strange reason. He didn't find it all that entertaining however. Finally, after following the boy through several winding streets, the group arrived at a stand called Ichiraku that apparently sold ramen. While ramen wasn't his favorite food, it wasn't his least favorite food either. It wasn't all that common in Suna actually, and he'd only had it maybe once or twice before, so he hadn't formed much of an opinion of it. Bankuro and Tamari didn't seem all that happy about the boy's choice, but they didn't seem too dismayed either. Baki just shrugged, smiled, and took a seat next to the one the boy was moving towards. Apparently, no insult had been intended by the boy's election of eatery. Hey. Tuchi-san. I brought you some more customers. The blonde boy called out to the stand's proprietor as soon as he was seated. Unlike the treatment the boy received from the village's other civilians, the greeting Naruto received from the proprietor of the stand was cheerful and enthusiastic. He could see why this place would be the boy's favorite restaurant. Even if the food wasn't the best, the atmosphere alone was. Relatively pleasant. Aki watched a boy that intelligence had indicated was the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi no Kitsune interact with Gara. The difference between the two boys was like night and day. Where Gara was cold and withdrawn, Naruto was open and rather friendly, and he could tell that it mostly wasn't an act to put him and his students off their guard. Based on the behavior of the civilian population, it had not been their actions towards the boy that had made the difference between him and Gara, which made him wonder all the more what had. As he watched a boy converse with his students and eat, he ate a meal of his own. While Raymond wasn't his favorite food, it was acceptable. The name of the stand's owner was fitting for a ninja village, as it could mean both to make noodles by hand and to kill with one's bare hands. Based on the looks he was receiving from the man, the man was fully willing to try to live up to the second meaning of his name if he made any untoward moves towards Konoha's Jinchuriki. Perhaps that was the difference between the two boys. The few people who actually cared for the Kaiubi's Jinchuriki had gotten to him in time. Dabuza still couldn't figure out how Mei had managed to throw together a traditional wedding so fast. The wedding had happened a week after Mei had made her ultimatum, rather than after the months it usually took to properly plan and arrange such an undertaking. And the only way he could think of how that could have happened was that she had everything ready and waiting for when she finally netted a husband and only had to schedule the time of the wedding. All he really knew was that it had happened so fast that it had made his head spin. Practically one minute he was a erm, relatively free man, and the next, he had a Mrs. Mamachi hanging off his arm. At this moment, he could consider himself to be rather fortunate. He was alive and he had a beautiful wife, and things could have been worse, a lot worse. Still. Being married to the Mizukage had not been one of his stated goals in life. Admittedly, the first four were male but, still. As they negotiated the crowd of well-wishers and ass-kissers that had shown up to congratulate the new couple, Mei latched onto his arm as if she was almost afraid that he'd try to escape. Haku hovered nearby, ready to provide protection if it were needed. Considering the fact that Mei had two keke genkai, it probably wouldn't be. How many kids do you plan on having? Some guy in the crowd asked as they passed by. Kids. Oh, God. He could see it now. Even if they inherited only one of Mei's Keke Genkai, it would be bad enough when they start discovering their powers. The kid with dark reddish brown hair and brown eyes argues with his or her black-haired, green-eyed older sibling. All of a sudden, the Mizukage residence where he was stuck living as a house husband starts filling up with lava. Thank the gods that Haku would be there to sort things out. The evening before the Chunin exams were to start, Kankuro made his way to the barbecue restaurant that that blonde ninja had pointed out on the way back to Suna's quarters on his first day here. Tomorrow was the first day of the Chunin exams, and he figured that it would be well worth the expense to have a good dinner before they happened in case he didn't survive what was coming next. On his way to the restaurant, he saw a reasonably attractive civilian woman following a masked one-eyed shinobi, who seemed to be doing his level best to ignore her. The civilians in Suna had learned not to try something like that long ago, because if a shinobi didn't want attention, they didn't want attention, and clinging to them would more than likely result in severe injuries on the civilian's part. I don't see how you can stand putting up with him. The woman said to the shinobi who looked like he dearly wanted to shake the woman off but didn't quite dare to do so for some reason. And now, he's hanging around with foreigners. I wouldn't be surprised if his father was from Iowa. It was at that point that the shinobi finally decided to react. If he hadn't been a shinobi himself, he probably wouldn't have noticed it and would have thought it an accident like most of the other passers-by had. Most of the streets in Kanoha were simply hard-packed dirt as they had been since the founding of the village. 
while there wasn't too much dust due to certain dust control methods which had been put in place, including D-ranked missions assigned during the driest part of the year, there was the occasional mud puddle here or there either after it rained or there was a spill of some sort. In a lightning-fast move, the shinobi tripped the woman, knocked her into a particularly large and somewhat scummy-looking puddle that the other pedestrians had been avoiding, and continued on his way as if nothing had happened, having apparently reached the end of his rope and decided that doing so was worth the potential consequences should he be caught. As he continued on his way to the restaurant, chuckling over the stupidity of the woman who had apparently insulted a friend of the shinobi, several people moved to help the woman who was shrieking as if someone had just tried to murder her. The place he was going to was owned by one of the local ninja clans, and it was totally awesome. He'd been there once before, and he could completely understand how the Akamichi got so fat. Damari sighed as she walked through the park that had supposedly been built shortly after the founding of the village, in a joint effort between the Shadai Hokage and the head of the Ichiha clan, which had been pointed out to her by the blonde Kanoha Genin, on the way to register for the exams, which would be starting the next day. There were trees and flowers everywhere she cared to look as she wandered the main path. Both were a rather rare sight back in Suna, since only the hardiest of plants grew in the deep desert where her home was located. Briefly pausing in her tracks, she bent over to smell one of the roses that grew on the well-tended bushes that lined the cobblestone path. It was a real pity that this would all be gone soon. Both her village and Atagakur would be raising the village to the ground in a little over a month if things went according to plan. A park like this, no matter how nice, would not survive the coming battle. Ara felt slightly apprehensive about going to the Raymond stand while the boy named Naruto wasn't there. While the man who ran the stall treated him like just another customer while his best customer was there, he wasn't entirely certain that he would be treated the same if he weren't, and he wasn't too sure how he would react if he were treated differently. The man who had run the Raymond stand had been one of the few people in his life to actually be nice to him and expect little to nothing in return. When he reached Ichiraku Raymond, he took an available seat next to a black-haired shinobi and waited. The owner noticed him after a few seconds. Welcome. The man said warmly, giving him a genuine smile as he did so. Despite the fact that Naruto wasn't here to protect him or whatever, the man wasn't trembling and there wasn't any fear in his eyes. The man actually seemed to appreciate his presence. Relieved that this was so, he made his order, which the man promptly began to prepare. That settled it. When the time for the invasion came, he was going to have this man kidnapped and brought to Suna. Preparing for the upcoming Chunin exams which Kakashi had only just informed him that he'd signed the team up for that afternoon, Naruto carefully inspected his equipment, discarding anything that was irreparable. He would buy replacements for everything he discarded at the local supply store once he was done. If the exams followed the same format they had in Kiri, there would be a test of information gathering skills, followed by a test of team survival skills. He and his equipment would both need to be in top form during the second portion of the exams. Fortunately here, things would go differently since he held the home ground advantage. He knew the forest surrounding the village like the back of his hand from all of the time he spent playing in them. He knew just about every rock, tree, and hunting trap for miles around in any direction. He would be able to tell if anything was off long before he reached any traps or ambushes and react accordingly. This time, he would pass. This time, nobody on his team would be injured. This time, none of his comrades would die. Once he finished examining and sorting his supplies, he started sharpening his shuriken and kunai. Sakura went to inform Suzum that they wouldn't be meeting the next day because she had been entered into the Chunin exams. She had almost forgotten to do so in her excitement, and it was only when she had been mentally going over her tojutsu skills that she'd realized that she had a training session scheduled with Suzum tomorrow. This was six months earlier than she had expected to be entered, but she would be ready, she had to be. Three months ago, she would have been uncertain about this and spent the entire night worrying over whether she should take the exams or not, and she would have decided to take them in the end because Sasuke would be taking them and she didn't want Sasuke to leave her behind. Now, she was going to take the exams because they were the next step towards her future goal and she would pass on her own merits and for her own reasons. While she didn't want Sasuke to leave her behind, that wouldn't be the only reason she would be taking the exams. The Chunin exams were the first major step on the road to her future, and she would need to pass them to find where that road would lead. As he got some last-minute training in, Sasuke pummeled the training post in front of him with his fists, imagining that it was that man. He would be taking the Chunin exams tomorrow, and he needed to be in top form. Kakashi had sprung their entry into the Chunin exams on them as a surprise only that afternoon when he turned them loose from the day's training. If he'd informed them say, whenever it was that he'd entered them, he would have had more time to train and prepare. As it was, he was stuck getting in a great deal of last-minute training and hoping that he wouldn't be too exhausted tomorrow morning when they went to take the first test. 
That boy had told him to expect something along the lines of an information gathering exercise, which would be followed by a survival test of some sort that included combat. In order to prepare for the coming ordeal, he would train for a few more hours, and then he would gather any equipment he thought necessary for the exams. As the moon rose higher in the sky, causing the barred windows to cast bands of shadow, Satoshi lay back on the bunk in his cell. The last six days had been boring as hell. He would be getting out tomorrow, but not in time for the exams, so he wouldn't be playing Genin Plant, as he had been assigned to be before he'd gotten arrested. He wondered if Naruto was entered into this one, as he hadn't said a word about it when he'd dropped by to visit. He was pretty sure that he would have said something before now if he were entered, but, then again, Naruto hadn't visited him since his first day here, because he wanted him to learn his lesson. He honestly couldn't believe that he got caught stealing from a measly genin. Just for that, he was going to rob Binraku boy and his teammates blind before they went home. Tetsuo smiled as he played with his daughter who was crawling around and making a mess out of the pile of blocks. Tomorrow, Naruto would be taking the Chunin exams, and he wouldn't be able to be there for him, because Hata Kakashi was his sensei on paper. He could still wish him luck and cheer him on however, and he would be doing just that. Satoshi would be getting out of jail tomorrow afternoon as well. He sometimes wondered where he went wrong with the boy, and then he remembered that it wasn't him. His wife was a bit like Satoshi, but had sworn to quit stealing if he quit conning people. So far, they both had technically kept their word. The beloved missus for whom he'd happily sacrifice anything and everything had caught his attention when she had lifted his wallet and he had gotten hers when he conned her out of the 25,000 ryo she had stolen from him. It had been love at first sight. He'd known it when he'd taken back merely what she'd stolen from him and nothing more. If she'd just been a job to him, he would have gotten more than that piddling sum. The Hokage held the unopened letter he'd just received from the Mizukage, almost dreading what would be inside. Considering the way his luck had been going in regards to Kurigakur lately, there was a good chance that it would be another mess that would need to be sorted out. Just what he needed when he was already busy dealing with the Chunin exams. Eventually, after a great deal of deliberation, he decided to open the letter and get it over with the way one would finally rip off a band-aid. The sooner he read it, the sooner he could deal with whatever it was that needed to be dealt with. Anticipating the worst, he broke the seal and opened the scroll. Here goes nothing. Huh? All that worry over nothing. It was just a letter apologizing to him for not inviting him to the wedding between the new Mizukage and one Mamachi's abuser. Well, that was. Unexpected. After getting home and feeding his dogs, Kakashi ate his own meal in silence. Today had been a rather trying day, and tomorrow would be nerve-wracking. He had entered his team into the Chunin exams much the way Minato-sensei had entered him and his first team shortly after they'd graduated, so they could see exactly what they were up against and become determined to do better next time. It was best to set them up for failure now, so they would know what they needed in order to succeed later. Unlike him himself when he had been first sent to the exams, his team most likely wouldn't make it through, as they were barely willing to work with each other, and several larger, stronger, older, and more unified teams had been entered from Kanoha alone. Right now, they were marginally better than they had been before the sea rank from hell, but it didn't seem to be enough. He would be there for them though, and he would wish them luck, even though luck wouldn't be enough in this case. In the Mizukage tower in Kiri, Haku stood guard outside the door to the Mizukage's bedroom. He was going to make sure that nobody would intrude on this most important of nights. Back in the village he'd lived near when he was little, it had been something of a tradition to make a lot of noise outside of the home of a newlywed couple on their wedding night. He had a feeling that Tsubuza Sama wouldn't appreciate that though, and therefore had kept any local well-wishers away accordingly. As he began to drift off, there was a loud yell that pulled him out of his half-awake state. Before he could even think, he raced into the room from which the yell came only to find that Zabuza Sama and the new Mizukage were in a tangle of limbs and covers on the bed, and that there were no signs of intruders or a fight. Haku? Zabuza said, sounding somewhat irritated. Yes. He asked. That. Out. Blushing so badly that his normally exceedingly pale face probably looked like a tomato, he complied with his master's orders. Inuzuka Kiba swallowed his nervousness as he entered the room in which the first stage of the Chunin exams was to take place. There had been some sort of logjam in the corridor on the second floor due to some sort of commotion that had been caused by a few Chunin hopefuls, but that hadn't been much of a problem for his team since Hanada had helped them negotiate it with little difficulty. The room in which the test was to take place was one of the classrooms at the academy. It had a somewhat different layout than the classroom he'd been assigned to when he attended the academy however, as instead of the tiered seating he'd grown used to over the years he'd spent as a student, all of the desks were on one level. Adding to the somewhat foreign atmosphere was the fact that the room was completely packed with teenagers, all of whom looked older than him and his team. 
They were clustered in small groups and lounging around on the desks, chairs, and floor, and they looked to be from just about everywhere Kiri, Suna, you name it. While a large number of them were just silently waiting for what was to come, most were carrying on hushed conversations both spoken and in sign. Just being here just about put him into sensory overload, thanks to all of the unfamiliar sights, sounds, and smells. Fortunately, he had his teammates to ground him. The Ino Shikacho team showed up a couple minutes after his team's arrival. With the exception of Shikamaru who always seemed relaxed, they looked as nervous as he felt. Ino was twitching slightly as she surveyed the room and took in what he had minutes earlier, and Chaoji was betraying his anxiety by eating at a far more rapid pace than normal. All three clustered together a little more tightly than they had when they first walked into the room, as if seeking comfort from companions they had known all their lives. Team 7 showed up about a minute later, making it the entire rookie 8 plus 1 that had been entered into the exams. Sakura looked rather nervous, and both Sasuke and Naruto had serious expressions on their faces. Naruto, having taken the exams before, obviously knew exactly what he and his team were up against. It was still strange however to see such a serious expression on Naruto's face and such a stillness in his movements. The Naruto he'd known at the academy had never worn such an expression and had never been able to sit completely still. Naruto had been even louder and wilder than him back then. Sasuke however, Sasuke always looked grim. Practically the instant Team 7 arrived, Ino started molesting Sasuke while trading what had become her usual greeting with Sakura, since they had decided to become rivals over a boy that couldn't care less about either of them, instead of the best of friends that they used to be. Completely ignoring Sasuke's plight, Naruto exchanged greetings with Shikamaru and Chaoji, who he and Naruto used to hang out with on occasion, while Naruto was still in the academy. Sasuke himself pretended he wasn't being furred over by a pair of fangirls and ignored, or rather pretended to ignore, everyone else in the group. Since everyone was here, he decided to lead his team over to the two other teams to say hi, as it had been a while since he'd seen them, and almost two years since he'd last talked to Naruto when he'd interrupted one of the boys' D ranks the summer after Sasuke had started his Naruto the dropout kick. That, and Hinata had the damnedest crush on the Uzumaki boy, and if he didn't get her to say hi to him, nothing would. While he and Naruto hadn't exactly been friends, they had ditched the academy together often enough to almost be considered such, and the little group he, Naruto, Shikamaru, and Chaoji had formed hadn't exactly been the same without him. Naruto had been the high-spirited Omega of the pack, and even though the boy had constantly challenged each of the other's positions in the group, he'd always gotten knocked back down to the bottom. Now however, it almost seemed as if Naruto was the alpha of his own pack. After getting a closer look at Sasuke's misfortune, he exchanged greetings with a group of former classmates that he'd only seen in passing since the academy, as he'd been too busy to make much time to visit with them. Shikamaru mumbled a vague greeting, but then again, that was his style. Naruto smiled at Hinata, nearly causing her to faint, and Chaoji made one of his usual jokes about wanting to eat Akamaru, who had yet to hit his growth spurt. The dogs that the Inuzuka kept were much smarter than and lived much longer than ordinary dogs and would usually hit a growth spurt at around 3 to 4 years of age, during which they would rapidly shoot up to their full adult size. Sasuke ignored him as usual, and Sakura and Ino were still too busy arguing over Sasuke to really notice them. Hey Kabuto. You failed again I see. Naruto said when a grey-haired boy or possibly young man as he appeared to be somewhere between his mid-teens and very early twenties, walked up to the group to tell them to keep it down. Actually I missed the winter exams because I was sick. The boy named Kabuta replied. You know him? Ino asked, distracted from Sasuke by the newcomer who seemed to be the type that girls squealed over and called cute, as he had the even features of most males that were regarded as such. Yeah, I met him during the Kiri exams. He's Yukushi Kabuto, medic, and quite possibly the next Eternal Genin. He's failed the exam six times so far. Naruto replied. Next Eternal Genin? He asked. There was actually someone who had really earned the moniker of the Eternal Genin. He thought that was an urban legend, like the clan of ninjas that supposedly lived in the sowers. Yeah, the Eternal Genin's this really neat old guy who's been a genin since the days of the Nidame. Naruto replied, and what's more, he could tell that the other boy was actually telling the truth or had gotten way way better at lying over the past two and a half years. I went on a mission with him once last year. He's a really good cook and he tells the best stories. Naruto continued, looking slightly nostalgic. Most of the others in the group stared at Naruto in disbelief, as if they thought the more experienced genin was having them on. He almost thought that as well. It was just the sort of thing that an older genin would pull on the rookies. Hey, you still got those cards you showed my team back in Kiri? Naruto asked Kabuto. Yes. The boy named Kabuto said, deflating slightly. It looked like Kabuto had wanted to show off for the newbies, and Naruto had just ruined the surprise. Got one on Marabashi Kasuke? Naruto asked, grinning evilly. 
Ah yes. The Kabuto boy said reluctantly as he pulled out a deck of orange cards with a kanji for shinobi written on the backs in black and grabbed one from somewhere near the bottom. Kabuto the then flipped the card over to reveal a blank white face which changed to show information after he'd spun it around under his middle finger for a while. On the card, the picture of a man who looked to be around the same age as the Sandane, maybe even older was revealed. There was a listing of the number of missions the man had taken, which included over 2,500 D-ranks alone. Next to that was a grid that showed his skill set, which was amazingly powerful, if he was reading the chart right. There were three other, much smaller pictures on the card, one of a boy, one of a girl, and one of a man with an old-fashioned haircut, who looked to be wearing one of the early Jounin uniforms. Marabashi Kasuk. The boy named Kabuto said. Voluntarily remained a genin for over five decades, after making a stupid mistake during the Chunin exams and getting his two teammates killed. The Budo gave Naruto a significant glance after this statement and got a cold glare from Naruto in return. There was apparently some history behind this and he could tell that it wasn't good. It probably had something to do with the fact that Naruto had failed the exams during his first try a year and a half ago. There had been a large number of rumors about that floating around and he hadn't been sure what to believe back then or even now. After Kabuto had placed Marabashi Kasuk's card back in the deck, Sasuk requested information on someone named Rock Lee and someone named Gara. Kabuto obligingly pulled the requisite cards from the deck, apparently still hoping to impress the rookie Genin, despite Naruto ruining the show, as Naruto muttered when did he run into Gara. Apparently, Naruto already knew one of the people that Sasuke was asking about. Amazing. Kabuto said after he'd pulled up the requested information on Gara after a short lecture on some boy who had been in the spring cycle class and graduated six months before them. A genin, and he's already been on a B-rank mission. I got one of those on my record. Naruto said, not sounding too impressed. I caught some dumb ass chunin who was trying to steal from the hokage. The old man didn't pay me because I'd been there to prank him and because the damage caused exceeded the appropriate amount of remuneration for such a mission. Well, apparently Gara's returned from all of his missions completely uninjured, which is more than you can say. Kabuto said snippily, apparently somewhat upset with Naruto for ruining his fun. After his little display and a number of cutting remarks aimed at Naruto, Kabuto launched into a lecture on the exams themselves and the countries that would be participating, making it obvious that he was completely shunning Naruto as he did so, which was pretty damn funny, since Kabuto was an Omega type and Naruto had evolved into an Alpha. The lecture came to an end when Kabuto had somehow ended up in a fight with some ninja from a new village called Atagakur, and he got his ass handed to him after he had started talking about them. As the fight was coming to an end, the proctors finally made their dramatic entrance. Dramatic entrances had to be like a prerequisite for being a ninja or something. As he sat waiting, Naruto felt his leg twitching as the seconds ticked down toward the time when he would flip his test over and get started. As he listened to the proctor announce the rules for this test, it became obvious to him that it was information gathering like he had suspected. Two points off for cheating. As Satoshi had told him when he'd visited the other boy this morning, the first part of the exam was easy for someone who had passed it before to get past, it was the second part that was hard, since there was no predicting how that could go. When they were in Iowa, Satoshi, Suzum, and Kurosaki had to navigate a rather rocky arid region that wasn't quite desert during a heat wave. Their objective had been to find the other half of some object they had been given, which had been hidden within a set area, before another team could get their hands on it and make their way to a rendezvous point within three days. Well the second part of the exams usually followed along the simple lines of survival in wilderness, while grabbing the counterpart to what you were given before someone else got it or outright grabbing it from someone else who it was given to at the start, the real danger of that portion of the exam wasn't the unfamiliar terrain, it was the other teams. Well he had the home ground advantage here unless they were forced to enter one of the closed off areas that had been inaccessible even to him throughout his childhood, his team would be perfectly fine on the unfamiliar terrain aspect, it would be the other teams he would constantly have to worry about until that portion of the exams came to an end. Well the genin from Kanoha wouldn't kill their own, those from other countries probably wouldn't hesitate to kill them, and if even one member of their team was unable to continue due to injury, all three of them would fail the second portion of the exams. Eventually, the time to turn the test papers over and get a start on the first phase of the exams finally came. After he turned his over, he looked over the questions to see if there were any he could answer before resorting to cheating, since he didn't have that bit fully planned out. And he thought setting off an explosive tag and copying off the person next to him while everyone was distracted would get him thrown out, no matter how innovative it was. Crap. The problems were beyond tough. Well he could probably figure out the code, the rest was beyond him. This stuff was high tuning, about to become John and crap. It looked like he was going to have to catch someone cheating and do what they did if it were a copyable method. 
he wouldn't be able to do this more than once or twice however, and he'd have to shift methods every time, because if he caught them cheating, then it was certain that the supervising Chunin would as well. As he worked out his plan, he heard a small noise coming from the person seated next to him. He turned and noted to his surprise that it was Hinata. He was so used to the girl these days that he barely registered her presence, unless she deliberately did something to gain his attention which she almost never did. He knew that the girl had a crush on him since she constantly stalked him, hanging around at the edges of his peripheral vision, but, thanks to Suzum who had experience in that area, he knew better than to approach her about it. He wasn't too bothered by her presence since she was nice enough, and he thought she would be a good friend if she got over her shyness, but he still didn't approach her. With Hinata, it was like Suzum said, it was like hand taming a small bird, you don't try to force the issue, as that would cause the bird to fly away, you wait for the bird to come to you. If you'd like to copy off my test. The girl started shyly, almost as if she were afraid to speak as she offered her test to him. Thanks. He signed in reply, as he quickly looked over her test and copied down the answer to only one of the two problems that she'd filled out already. There, that was one problem out of the way. The Budo growled as his gaze landed on Naruto while he was looking around the room pretending to be trying to cheat. The only bit of enjoyment he got out of these crappy exams was showing off for the newbies, and Naruto had to go and ruin it for him. If Naruto hadn't been there, he was certain that the newbies would have been properly amazed and intimidated by his display, especially with that little show he'd arranged with the team from Odo. In Konoha, he was merely a genin and not regarded as an example of a very good one at that, despite his status as a medic and naturally had to take the exams in order to attain a promotion, since field promotions were very seldom handed out during peacetime. Despite the fact that he was ostensibly attempting to obtain a promotion, he deliberately threw the exams every time he took them in order to gain information he otherwise would not have attained or otherwise would have been forced to risk his life to attain through other means, as espionage was his true goal. Thanks to the exams, he knew the layouts of each of the hidden villages of the five elemental nations and a great deal of information on the capabilities of hundreds of genin and dozens of chunin. The exams themselves however, were a pain in the ass despite it being completely worth it in the end. In the Togakur, he was a Takubetsu Jounin and had gotten the rank the old-fashioned way through the betrayal of his village. His true level of knowledge in the medical field was second only to perhaps Arachimaru Tsunade and in Odo, he got to show it off. There, he had assisted Arachimaru on a number of experimental procedures and performed a few experiments himself. As a scientist, his hands itched to study a number of the people in the room, especially the two Jinchuriki and Ichiha Sasu who had apparently finally awakened his Sharingan. Realizing that he'd been gazing at the blonde menace while he'd been lost in his musings on the exams, he turned his gaze away from Naruto and flicked it around the room in a logical search pattern. There. He'd found the plant. Time to start cheating. On the day I finally get Naruto onto my exam table, I'm going to forget the anesthetic. He thought as he started copying off the chunin who had been planted in the crowd. Naruto knew that he had a loud mouth at times, a lot of the time in fact, especially in situations when he was nervous and his life didn't depend on his being quiet. Tetsuo Sensei had worked with him on it for two years and had only been marginally successful in his efforts as he no longer ran around the village, screaming for attention at the top of his lungs. When he was on missions or when he was in what Kanohamaru had dubbed that mood, he was relatively quiet. Other times however. His noisiness in manner and volume was a form of stress relief, as well as an attention-seeking behavior. The academy got to experience this in the form of a highly disruptive prankster. His former team had got to experience it in the form of a rather rowdy and rambunctious boy who practically bounced off the walls. His current team usually got to experience his loud nature in the form of some rather vicious arguments that were usually between him and Sasuke. Everyone who took the Chunin exams that day got a little taste of it as well, when he decided to be confrontational and refused to back down, despite the proctor's best efforts to get him and everyone else in the room to do so. He'd been under far more stress than he was willing to admit that day, despite the fact that he'd been telling himself that the second part of the exams would be a snap due to home ground advantage, because he knew that they wouldn't be even with the home ground advantage. No matter how many times he told himself that everything would be fine, he failed to convince himself, especially after Kabuto had just had to go and remind him exactly why he'd been lying to himself and ruin what little good mood he had upon arriving for the test, adding extra pressure to what was already a tense situation. When the tenth question came around, much to his shame and embarrassment, he had found himself seriously considering joining those who were opting out and running. His teammates didn't have nearly the experience he did, and there were a large number of people here with far more experience than him, and just as many with more experience than him and his less experienced teammates who were running from the question as well. 
considering how inexperienced they were, his teammates wouldn't stand a chance on their own during the second phase, and there was a distinct possibility that he wouldn't be able to protect them, the way he hadn't been able to protect his former teammates and his comrades the last time he took the test, even with an extra year and a half as a ninja under his belt. Instead of raising his hand as he'd seriously considered doing however, he had found himself rising to meet the challenge that the proctor at the front of the room had presented. He'd always hated it when people had told him he'd fail at something without ever giving him a chance to prove himself, and that Ibiki jerk had been strongly hinting that that was the case. Bring it on old man. He yelled when he got the proctor's attention. I won't back down, and even if I fail, I'll find a way to become a chunin, even if I have to wait three decades for a field promotion. Instead of smacking him down for his audacity as he expected would happen, the man looked around the room for a minute and smiled before informing everyone who had remained at the time of his rather ill-thought-out outburst that they had passed the first portion of the exams. Apparently, the tenth question had been a first-phase surprise. He should have known that the proctor was springing a first-phase surprise on them. That had happened the last time he'd taken the exams as well. During the exams in Kiri, the proctor had told them that they would have the choice of taking the old academy graduation test or not, and that those who chose not to take the graduation test would be sent home. If he'd been told beforehand exactly what Kiri's old graduation test had been, he probably would have been one of the ones racing out of the room as fast as his legs could carry him. The fact that his teammates had stayed had made him wonder for a while, until he realized that they had quite likely been as ignorant of the particulars of that test as he had. He was rather violently jarred from his musings on the nature of the last first phase surprise that had been sprung on him during the winter exams in Kiri, when one Midarashi Anko, proctor for the second phase of the exams, made a dramatic entrance that would have normally scored a 7. But got an 8 for the sheer shock that it had caused when she had gone sailing in through a closed window, while the proctor for the first phase was giving a dramatic speech on exactly why they had passed his portion of the exams that had included the display of a number of rather gruesome-looking scars. Anko was the wild sort of person that looked like she'd be a lot of fun to hang out with. Too bad she was so old that it would look weird if they did. Tomorrow morning, they would be taking the second test, and he would pass this one with his team intact, or he would die trying. As Ibiki gathered all of the written tests, one in particular caught his eye. It had been the one belonging to the child who had challenged him and inspired such a large number of teams to continue in the process. The boy had only answered four of the questions on the test, making him one shy of the number that would have gotten him disqualified. Sneaky little bastard. Ibiki muttered, chuckling as he gathered the rest of the tests. He really should have thought this test through better. With the way it had been set up, a couple of brain iacs and a few crafty little bastards like the Yuzumaki had slipped through. Near the fence to the forest of death, Kanohimaru grinned as the boss pretended to run away from his three-person rock, which contained himself and two of his classmates, Yudin and Mogi. He jumped at the chance to interview the candidates in the Chunin exams for the Academy newspaper, so he'd be able to wish Naruto luck before the second phase of the exams. He would not have been allowed in the area otherwise, since it was restricted to all but the proctors, the Chunin hopefuls, and the Academy newsletter. His and his friend's dramatic entry had caused a great deal of laughter, especially when they had ended up choking on the colored smoke they had used because they had put a little too much gunpowder in the mix. The proctor an awesome-looking lady with dark purple hair and skimpy clothes looked about ready to yell at them until they had informed her that they belonged there because they had been ordered to do an article for the academy paper. After the introductions had been gotten out of the way, she had given them 10 minutes to do their business and get gone. When he saw Naruto when he had arrived with his friends, his boss looked to be in that mood, but a few minutes of fun had picked his mood up considerably by the time their interview had finished and they were forced to leave. Naruto had even introduced them to someone named Kabuto who apparently knew a lot about how the exams went in other countries and had a bunch of cool ninja info cards to show them and to give them a foreign perspective on the exams, Naruto had introduced them to a team from Suna. The two boys were rather scary, but the girl named Tamari was rather nice. Mogi thought she was cool and Yudin looked as if he had a crush on her. All too soon however, it was time to leave and when they did so, Naruto was smiling and didn't look as nervous as he had when they arrived. Mission accomplished. Sorry about ruining your fun yesterday. Naruto said to Kabuto as they moved back towards the main group after seeing Kanohimaru and his friends off. It's okay. Kabuto replied. Thanks for letting me do the interview with the academy students. You're welcome. He replied as Kabuto moved towards his team, they seemed even more impressed than my team did when you showed us your cards on the way to Kiri. As he made his way back to his own team, he couldn't help but stop and stare at the other Chunin hopefuls that were clustered near the fence that surrounded training ground 44. He honestly didn't know why so many of the teams had coordinated their outfits like Kabuto's team had. As far as he was concerned, doing something like that was a waste of both time and money. 
he couldn't have gotten his team to coordinate outfits even if he wanted to anyway. While Sasuke had gotten some shirts with the Ichiha fan discreetly stitched into the collar for situations in which he could go into battle, the boy would not budge on color and only wore either black or blue. Sakura wouldn't budge on the color red either, just like the way he hadn't budged on the color orange, but was willing to wear more subdued shades if the situation called for it. When they made Chunin though, all that would quite likely go out the window, as almost all Chunin wore the basic shinobi uniform and only really started varying their attire again when they made Takibetsu Jounin or Jounin. There were always a few holdouts or exceptions though, and Sakura would probably be one of them. All too soon it was time to enter the forest, the release forms were signed, the scrolls were handed out, and the wait was over. After another brief wait at a gate, they were inside the one forest near Kanoha that he had not yet explored as a guy in a mask, had kept him out of it the one time he tried when he was little, which mostly negated the home ground advantage he'd been counting on. During the first few minutes in the woods, he caught some morons sniffing around the team and sent the idiot packing with his tail between his legs. Things went well for the next few hours after that, right up until everything went to hell. A wind that was most likely the result of a jutsu split the group and he ended up being forced to kill a goddamn snake that had to be the size of his apartment building in order to get back to his teammates who had been left like sitting ducks. When he reached his teammates, it was only to find some bitch holding Sasuke and Sakura under the worst killing intent he'd ever felt. Even though he was a little ways away from where his teammates stood paralyzed, he could barely move himself. Fortunately, Sasuke managed to make his escape with Sakura before the two could be killed. Had the Ichiha left Sakura behind, he would have murdered the boy, teammate or no teammate, Sharingan or no Sharingan. One of the first rules he'd learned was that you don't leave a teammate behind. As Sasuke and Sakura fled from the bitch who'd attacked them, he followed them, doing his best to keep ahead of another building-sized snake that was hot on his tail. He and Sasuke both turned and killed the snake after Sakura had been gotten to safety, only to have the bitch who had apparently been controlling the creature burst out of it in a demented parody of a stripper hopping out of a cake, like the one Tetsuo sensei got in trouble for when someone hired her for his birthday party as a joke. The bitch whose hit I ate said she was from grass, then shot up the tree the team was in, looking very much like the animal whose inside she had burst forth from in a way that was reminiscent of a horror movie he and his teammates had watched that had left him hiding under his bed for an entire night. They just barely managed to dodge this new attack, and when they did, Sasuke offered up their scroll in a somewhat cowardly but sensible move, considering the difference in power between their team and the grass Kinoichi. The woman had been rather easily handing them their asses, and once she quit playing around, there was a good chance that they would die. Well he lamented the lost chance to continue and possibly pass the exams this time around, so he didn't start looking like the six-time loser Kabuto, who was only now taking them as a formality, rather than out of any hope of promotion, it was better that they got out of there with their lives and limbs intact. They could always try again in January. The bitch hadn't wanted the scroll however. That had been made apparent when she destroyed it before their eyes and threw Sasuke into a nearby tree, knocking him out. It seems that the Sharingan wasn't nearly as powerful as I was led to believe. The bitch said to Sasuke who was just regaining consciousness after that rather painful whack to the head. Either that, or you are a particularly worthless specimen. Since you showed the smallest amount of promise earlier however, I'll give you one more chance to redeem yourself later, and if you don't do so, you'll die along with the rest of your pathetic village when the time comes. Until then Sasuke kun The bitch said before she vanished. Who the hell was that? Sasuke groaned. I have no effing idea, but thanks to your boneheaded maneuver, we now need two scrolls instead of one he replied. It figured something would go wrong, it was almost as if he were cursed or something. If they failed because of this, he was going to be taking it out of Sasuke's hide later. It had been Sasuke who that bitch who had destroyed their scroll had been after after all. In the middle of the forest, Anko stood on a tree branch sore and shaking, as the seal on her neck burned. This was supposed to be a nice relaxing job, a break between more strenuous missions. Instead, she'd run into Orochimaru who had been trolling the forest for recruits, or more likely, considering what usually happened to the people he got his hands on, even his own students, test subjects for his experiments. Based on what the man had told her before he wandered off, he already had an unfortunate candidate in mind. She pitied the poor child and hoped that he or she could manage to escape Orochimaru's clutches before something irreversible happened, such as the seal she had been given. She couldn't stop the tune in exams however, because they were all that were keeping Orochimaru entertained at the moment and therefore keeping him from going on a killing spree and taking out anyone and everyone he came across. The genin in the forest were a small sacrifice when held up against the entire population of Konoha. After two days of searching following the debacle with a bitch from grass, Naruto found the perfect team to steal scrolls from. They had gotten both of their scrolls in the middle of the night and instead of heading straight to the tower like they should have done, the idiots had settled down for a nap. 
Since they weren't from Kanoha, he didn't feel the least bit of guilt over taking their scrolls. Fortunately for him and his team, Satoshi had taught him a thing or two about making off with things that didn't belong to him, and these guys weren't Jounin, not by a long shot. The guy on watch had been half asleep, and neither of his teammates had woken up when he wandered through their camp taking the scrolls and setting a couple of traps to slow them down when they became aware that he'd done so and attempted pursuit. Idiots. After that, it was a straight shot to the tower, during which he took point in case of traps. There had been a great many blocking their way, but he had been able to navigate past them, going around the ones he couldn't disable. Shortly after dawn on the third day of the second phase of the summer Chunin exam, Team 7 arrived at the tower. As he stood before the teams of Jenin who had passed the second phase of the exams, the Hokage shoved down his feelings of concern. Arachimaru had managed to infiltrate the exams, and they were forced to go on as if nothing had happened in order to keep Arachimaru from going on a rampage. And keep people from panicking until he actually did so as the destruction they caused in their panic could be equal to or greater than any destruction Arachimaru may cause. While he personally wanted to stop what was happening, he knew that it would have to continue as if nothing were amiss. He gained a small measure of amusement from watching the shocked expressions of the genin who stood below him as he explained the true meaning and history of the exams in which they had decided to participate. Long ago, this would simply have been taken in stride. Now however, after so many years of peace, he was in front of a generation that had never experienced the horrors of war and therefore were shocked by the mere idea of it. When had he gotten so old? Standing below the Hokage and beside her teammates, Sakura felt her heart hammering in her chest as a set of unexpected preliminaries were being announced. Out of the 13 potentially passing teams, seven had made it here intact. Two others had made it here not so intact and had been disqualified. One scroll had been destroyed by the woman who had also swallowed her own scroll, who had attacked her team on the first day. That meant that four scrolls and therefore two teams were still out there unaccounted for and unable to pass because they'd missed the deadline. Because of the unusually high number of passing teams, a set of preliminary matches were going to be held immediately in order to further whittle down the number of candidates before the third phase of the exams, which would be taking place in front of an audience of important dignitaries at some point in the near future. The proctor for this preliminary bout was asking if anyone wished to quit here and now, especially since there was an odd number of candidates. The answer as far as she was concerned was hell no. She hadn't gone this far and risked this much to back down now. While she stood firm knowing that she was close to her goal of becoming a medic and whatever may follow it, the older boy named Kabuto that she had met during the first phase quit at that point, making the group an even 20. That decision to quit had made it his failure record for the Chunin exam 7 for 7. Personally, she didn't understand why someone would go so far and drop out when they were so close to their goal. Why even bother to enter in the first place if you were going to do something like that? Soon, attention was diverted from Kabuto's recent failure and towards the electronic board that would announce who was fighting who that had been revealed. Moments later, the first names appeared. Sasuke was first off the bat and he would be facing the sound genin who had attacked Kabuto before the first test. Arachimaru watched in anticipation as the Ichiha boy made his way down into the indoor arena where he would be fighting one of his minions. Despite the fact that the boy had given such a disappointing showing in the forest, he had decided to stay and watch the preliminaries. He was giving his potential vessel one more chance to prove his strength. If the boy failed here and therefore failed to reach the arena next month, he would be as worthless as the rest of Kanoha and would deserve to die in the invasion. He would not run the chance of severely weakening himself by pouring himself into a fragile vessel. There was still a question of whether or not this one was truly as weak as he had appeared however. He wasn't entirely certain if it had been cowardice or pragmatism that had led the Ichiha to hand over his scroll five days ago when he had gone against him in the forest. Today, he would be able to tell which it had been. While handing the scroll over was a cowardly act on the surface, it was also an act of pointless stupidity to throw one's life away, fighting an opponent they couldn't defeat for little to no gain, especially when what you desired could come to you more easily if you were prepared to wait. If Ichiha Sasuke failed the preliminaries, he would prove his utter worthlessness and would die before he left the building. If he succeeded, he would watch the boy during the third phase of the exams and see how he compared to the strongest of his generation, especially the Jinchuriki. If Sasuke proved himself as strong as he thought him to be, he would take the boy then and there. If he didn't prove his strength to be superior however, the last Ichiha would die, and good riddance. He'd never cared for the Ichiha anyways. They were overly proud and arrogant, content to rest on the laurels of bygone ancestors and a rather treasonous lot to boot. The only thing he found even potentially useful about them were their eyes which he had a clone stockpile of that he hadn't bothered using because he'd have to cover an implanted eye when not in use to prevent it from draining his chakra the way the Kakashi boy did. 
there were several other Kekei Genkai he could take if the Ichiha proved to be an utter failure, but the Ichiha's eyes were the one that would put him much closer to his goal of learning every jutsu ever created. The eyes would be useless to him however if they were housed in a weak body, as that would weaken him as well. But the chakra drain involved when using Sharingan eyes that weren't one's own, he would much prefer taking the Ichiha boy as a vessel than taking his eyes from his corpse or using the ones he'd stockpiled when making Shimura Danzo's special arm, but he would implant them if left with no other alternatives. Instead of drawing one of the strongest available amongst a group of candidates that were in the preliminaries, someone who would bring out the Ichiha boy's true strength so he wouldn't have to wait another month to see it. Sasuke's opponent had turned out to be one of his throwaway pawns that he had planned to use to test Sasuke's ability to handle the seal he had planned on placing on the boy until the Ichiha child had proven to be somewhat of a disappointment. Rather than being a foil to test a newly acquired curse seal against, the minion would now be a secondary test of the power of the Ichiha child as well as his prized Sharingan. As he'd more than half expected he would, Sasuke had proven himself far more able with a foe he believed he had a chance of defeating, proving that his handing over his scroll several days before had been more an act of pragmatism than cowardice. There had been more than four days left before the deadline and a number of scrolls floating around where the boy could get his hands on them after all. Why keep something that could cost you your life when you could get something just like it elsewhere and from someone much weaker than the opponent you were facing after all? After a rather short fight in which Sasuke proved himself to be superior to his opponent in every way, Sasuke eventually finished Osu off with a move that his father had been rather famous for during the days when he'd served on the field, rather than as the chief for police. As he watched the trap Dosu burn, he found himself eagerly anticipating Sasuke's next test, the one that would prove whether or not the boy truly was worthy of his time and attention. All too soon for the participants in that match, the second set of names were called. Abumi's Aku made his way down to the arena floor a second after Aburam Shino. When the time for the battle came, he wasted no time in blasting the boy in the trench coat with his Zankuha. The boy evaded his attacks with relative ease however and called upon an army of bugs. Growing frustrated with his lack of success, he then tried to blast both the boy and the bugs, only to have his arms ripped apart from the inside. He lay on the ground in unbearable agony, knowing that he'd failed both Lord Orochimaru and himself. His technique had backfired on him, ripping his arms open to relieve the pressure because his opponent had crammed the openings in his palms full of bugs. Once again he had been overconfident and tried to fly too high, and once again he had failed. He had failed himself and Lord Orochimaru, who had taken him off the streets and had made him strong, so he would never again have to stoop so low as to risk his life in order to steal a crust of bread in order to survive. After his name was called, Inuzuka Kiba felt somewhat uncertain as he made his way to the arena floor. While he had always been able to defeat Naruto rather easily back at the academy that had been over two and a half years ago and Naruto had changed a great deal since then. The loud-mouthed prankster who couldn't be serious if he tried that he knew and skipped classes with long ago looked very serious at the moment. Instead of bouncing with excitement or trembling with fear like he would have been doing when they were in the academy together, he was almost completely still as they stood in front of the proctor and waited for their fight to start. He opened the fight with one of his better moves, a move that would have knocked the old Naruto out for days, in order to test the boy. Instead of standing there and taking the blow as he would have done back then, Naruto managed to dodge. At the very least, the Uzumaki's speed had improved to some degree since the academy. Deciding to try a different tack, he threw a couple of smoke bombs at Naruto in order to cover his attacks. Then, he and Akamaru launched themselves into the fight. Despite the disorienting smoke, they soon found themselves launched out of it again, heading in different directions with an explosive tag attached to each of them. Fortunately, the boy had placed a tag with a slightly longer timer on Akamaru, allowing him to save the dog from serious injuries, which had apparently been his plan all along, since Naruto went on the offensive while he was distracted with rescuing Akamaru. Before he knew it, he was on the ground and in pain, and Akamaru was on the ground on the other side of the arena. In a rather desperate move, he pulled out a pair of food pills. If he wanted any chance of passing, there was nothing left to do but pull out his best attack. And to think, he was going to have to use the Gitsuga against the boy who had been touted as the absolute last of the class for a few years before he somehow managed to graduate the academy two years early, the boy he used to be able to easily pound into the dirt whenever he wanted to. After taking one of the pills, he tossed the other to Akamaru but Naruto caught it before it could reach the dog and crushed it underfoot. Throwing another to replace the one that had been destroyed would be pointless, since Naruto would just catch and destroy that one as well. But the way things were going, he would have to help Akamaru was able to distract Naruto while he did the Tsuga instead. Preparing for his solo attack, he threw another two smoke bombs to disorient his opponent, and Akamaru launched himself into the smoke cloud. 
After Akamaru jumped in to pin his opponent, he flew towards the boy, spinning at an insane rate, while Akamaru attacked from the other side. The attack failed however, because Naruto had managed to shake Akamaru off and dodge his attack and counter it, even with the smoke cloud disorienting him. Still desperate to win or at the very least land a single blow, he flew at Naruto once more, and the result was the same. Eventually, after giving his best and after several failed attacks, he was forced to admit defeat when Naruto finally knocked him down one more time than he could rise. Naruto definitely wasn't the Omega of the pack he remembered, but an alpha in his own right. After Kiba had forfeited, Sakura's heart leapt into her throat as the next two names came up on the board. She would be fighting Ino next. Ino who had once been her friend, Ino who was her rival for Sasuke's affections, Ino whom she had been trailing after practically all her life, Ino who was a beautiful cosmos flower while she was still a bud was her opponent, and she would have to fight her if she wanted to pass the exams so she could be free to become a medic. Back when they were in the academy together, Ino had defeated her in just about everything but academics. Ino had trounced her during their tojutsu spars and outperformed her in the womanly arts. Ino had beat her then and would quite likely beat her now. Even though she was afraid to face her, she would have to since the other girl was standing in the way of her future. She would have to defeat Ino who had always been better than her in order to move forward. Swallowing down her nervousness, she made her way to the arena floor. She would have to get past her fear and give it her all and pray that it was enough. As Ino was being led away from the arena, the girl found herself wondering if she knew Sakura anymore, as her former friend had changed a great deal in the months since she had last seen her. Someone had apparently replaced the somewhat insecure girl she had known with a competent Kinoichi while she hadn't been looking. The girl whom she had expected to fall to her might had instead risen to the challenge and taken the advantage presented to her when she had rather stupidly pulled one of her punches, believing Sakura to still be as weak as she used to be. Thanks to that pulled punch, she had been steadily driven into a corner by the girl's furious onslaught which had followed until she had eventually fallen. After years of winning in just about every arena other than love, she had finally lost to Sakura. The Kashi proudly greeted Sakura after she'd returned from her fight with the Yamanaka girl. Despite their differences, his team had performed admirably so far. They had managed to work together long enough to make their way through the forest to the tower, and all three of them had passed the preliminary matches, advancing to the next round. He was slightly worried about Sasuke though. The boy obviously had some anger issues. Using a jutsu like the Ryuka no jutsu in a preliminary bout had been overkill, especially since he already had his opponent on the ropes and pretty much defeated when he used it, making its use highly unnecessary. Naruto had of course performed admirably as always, just as his father would have done. The boy had used excellent strategies to take out the Inuzuka's greatest advantages and carry the day. He would not have expected any less of Minato sensei's son. In her recent battle, Sakura had somehow managed to surprise him as well. The girl had grown greatly over the last couple of months. The student he had thought the weakest and least likely to succeed had managed to defeat the daughter of the head of the Amanaka family. Not only had she managed to defeat the girl, she had defeated her soundly. He probably wasn't going to forget that rather vicious bit of hair pulling she had engaged in in order to win anytime soon though. Fortunately for Sakura, Naruto had convinced her to pin her hair up and cover it for the exams. Only four bouts into the preliminaries and he could already brag that his entire team had passed into the finals not bad. It would be even better if Guy's team didn't pass though. He'd be able to hold it over the man's head for years if that happened. As soon as Sakura and Ino cleared out of the arena, the names for the fifth fight in the preliminaries were called, and Kankuro and Akato Yorue made their way down to the arena. Kankuro had rather cleverly in his opinion switched himself out with Karasu when everyone had been paying attention to the bitch fight between the two leaf Kanoichi that had been passed off as a preliminary bout and therefore was being carried into the arena rather than walking. Soon, Yorue and Karasu were standing in front of the proctor who was refereeing the preliminaries, waiting for their fight to start. The moment the signal was given, both Karasu and Yorue burst into motion. Yorue grabbed the only bit on Karasu that would have been exposed skin on Kankuro, his face. Despite his facial covering that masked all expression, the man somehow managed to look completely stunned when absolutely nothing happened after he grabbed Kankuro's face. Whatever the man had planned to do had apparently required physical contact with the real Kankuro in order for him to pull it off. Following Yorue's failure, Karasu went on the offensive and beat Yorue to a pulp at Kankuro's direction. Kankuro found the fight to be easy and was amused by the fact that he'd never once been forced to show himself throughout the entire bout. Apparently his opponent had been a one-trick pony and he'd somehow neutralized that trick without even trying. As soon as the proctor announced his victory, he swapped places with Karasu and made his way back to Baki-sensei and his siblings. There was no reason to remain wrapped in those stifling bandages any longer than necessary. 
Practically the instant Kankuro returned to his teammates, the names for the sixth bout were announced. Tamari would be fighting someone named Tenten. As she made her way down to the arena and Proctor who would start the match, Tamari sized her opponent up. The girl looked more serious than her other Kanoha counterparts and obviously hadn't spent as much time on her hair and clothing as that ridiculous pair who had been clawing at each other and trying to pull the other's hair had done. Good, this might actually be a real match rather than a bitch fight like the one that had taken place between the two other Leaf Kanoichi. In the opening moves of their fight, her opponent showed herself to be something of a budding weapon specialist when she went on the offensive. It was such a pity that she had to come up against a wind mistress considering. Unlike just about every other girl in Kanoha that she'd encountered during her stay, the girl actually seemed to take her position as a Kanoichi seriously. She would rather have seen her in the final phase of the exams than that pink-haired harridan who spent a good minute pulling that blonde's hair. When the girl realized that her initial moves had failed and that she would need to step up her game, she released three storage scrolls worth of weapons and did something with ninja wire that undoubtedly would have caught Kankuro's interest as a puppet master before the bout was over. But eventually the fight ended in her favor as she blew the last of the weapons away and caught the girl in a kamitachi no jutsu, which was rather aptly named after the sickle weasel which floated through the winds, slicing anyone it encountered with its razor-sharp claws, according to legend. After catching the wounded girl on her fan, she flicked her aside and one of the boys on her team jumped down and caught her before she hit the ground. After the boy had caught his teammate, she talked a bit of trash with the boy she could be battling in a month and left the arena. While she had a little more respect for her opponent than she did the two other Kanoichi she had seen battle, she still found the Leaf Kanoichi to be weak compared to her. She had hoped for a greater challenge than the one she had gotten only to have those hopes dashed. Considering the apparent strength of the Leaf's forces, when it came time for the invasion, Kanoha was going to be toast. As soon as Tenten's weapons were all cleared from the arena floor, the names for the seventh bout were selected and announced. Lee wasn't sure if he should be happy or disappointed that he had been selected to fight Akamichi Chaoji. While the Akamichi were powerhouses when it came to Tejutsu, the heavy boy was both slower and less experienced than him, thus the disappointment. The potential joy over the selection of his opponent came from the fact that he would have a much better chance of advancing to the finals and facing a truly strong opponent during the third phase of the exams, in front of all of the dignitaries that the Hokage had mentioned, proving that a genius of hard work could succeed. The battle that came next was short and almost brutally one-sided, as even with the weights holding him back, he moved far too quickly for Chaoji to counter. Chaoji's punches and kicks were undoubtedly powerful, as was his human bullet tank technique, but he had been able to rather easily avoid them, and kicking Chaoji around like he were a soccer ball had not been nearly as fun as it had apparently looked to his audience, who had cheered when Chaoji had hit the far wall of the arena. He had been hoping for a most youthful battle in which both parties gave their all but it looked like he would have to wait until the third phase for that to happen. As soon as Lee and the rather battered Chaoji were cleared from the arena floor, the names for the eighth bout were announced. They were Hayuga Hinata and Hayuga Niji. Hinata, who had been over the moon about the fact that Naruto was actually speaking with her, even if it was only about the properties of the homemade medicinal ointment that she had given him, had been forcefully slammed down to earth by the name of her opponent. That couldn't possibly have been a random selection. Someone had to have bribed whoever it was that programmed the boards, either that or a Hayuga had programmed the board at some point when it became apparent that preliminaries would be necessary. She understood why it had been done. Compared to Niji and her younger sister, she was weak. If she somehow made it to the final part of the exams and failed in front of the assembled dignitaries, her family would be seen as weak. By having her fight Niji and be eliminated now, it was guaranteed that a Hayuga would make it to the final phase and not shame the family when they did so. She felt sadness and anger at this. She had worked so hard to be strong and had hoped to prove to herself and everyone around her that she was so during the Chunin exams. She had always wanted to be like Naruto who always picked himself back up off the ground and climbed ever higher after every time he did so. Every time she faced an obstacle however, she found herself stopping and backing away. This time didn't appear to be an exception, as while well Aniji kept telling her that she was a failure and always would be a failure she found herself drawing in on herself, trying to protect herself from his words. Suddenly, as she was about to give up, a voice that never failed to cause her heart to skip a beat called out Kaman Hinata, don't give up now, I know for a fact that you're much better than this. Naruto believed in her. Naruto believed in her. She couldn't give up now, she had to prove to both herself and everyone else that she was as strong as Naruto believed her to be. Emboldened by the words of the boy she admired, she moved to strike. Niji provided no openings, no matter what she did however. Eventually, after what seemed like forever, her eyes found one. She scored a hit. She scored a hit against Niji. She could do this. She couldn't do this. Niji proved too strong and too fast. 
He closed all of the Tenketsu on her arms, disabling her Juken strikes. All she could do now was try to block him. She couldn't block him forever, and the pain in her chest from one of his earlier strikes grew to be too much. She collapsed and nearly lost consciousness. As the proctor announced her defeat and the Jounin moved in to save her from Niji's next attack, she struggled to rise. She wouldn't stay down. She wouldn't stay down. She would get up like Naruto. She stood and then she fell. Naruto clutched the railing in shock. If he had known that this would happen, he would not have called out any encouragement despite the fact that he'd promised Hinata that he'd be rooting for her as she'd left for the arena floor. He had seen Hinata faltering and decided then would be a good time to cheer her up a bit, especially since he now considered her to be something of a friend now that he'd actually talked to her. After he'd loudly cheered her on, Hinata had fought instead of forfeiting like she had looked like she had been about to do. She had fought bravely and now, because she had fought, she could die. Niji however had not needed to be so brutal. He had not needed to put Hinata down so much and he had not needed to attack her so viciously, especially considering the fact that Hinata was both family and a comrade to the Hayuga boy. Hinata was his friend and as soon as he got a chance to do so, he was going to show Niji exactly what he did to people who harmed his friends. If Hinata's teammates didn't take him out back and show him what they did to people who hurt their teammate first that is. As her teammates, the Inuzuka and the Aburam had first dibs on any actions that might be taken against the Hayuga bastard for what he'd done to Hinata. As she was carried off, Niji watched his cousin who persisted in calling him big brother, despite the fact that he had done everything to make it clear that he disliked her go. She had proven herself a loser as fate had decreed her to be, but. As he looked back on the fight, he remembered the moment that her eyes had changed and how there had been steel in her spine if only for a little while. In that moment, she had seemed strong and fierce, and traces of that fierceness had remained in the moments afterward when she refused to quit, even though it was obvious from the beginning that she had lost, and in the moment she rose despite the fact that she should have stayed down. She had lost as fate decreed she would however. People don't change. Once a loser, always a loser. There were no exceptions. As soon as Niji walked away confident in his understanding of how the world worked, the ninth match was called, and it was Nara Shikamaru and Tsuchi Kin who would be fighting in this bout. Shikamaru wouldn't have bothered, except that it would be more troublesome for him if he backed out now, since he had failed to back out when he'd been given the chance to do so. If he just stayed up here now, he'd be hearing about it from his peers, his teammates, his mother, and Asuma-sensei for years. Whether he won or lost, it would be better to just get it over and done with now, so he wouldn't have to hear anything about it from anyone. Gin proved to be an interesting if somewhat easy to read opponent. After determining the nature of her sound-based Jinjutsu attack, he swiftly caught her in his Kajimane and made her knock herself out by hitting her head against a nearby wall while dodging a flying shuriken. Now that that was over and done with, he couldn't wait for the 10th battle to take place so he could get the hell out of here and maybe catch some cloud-watching time before the team went out for Chaoji's consolation dinner. After the unconscious kin had been cleared away, the 10th match was called and it was Gara against Tsurubi Misumi. As Misumi made his way down to the arena, he wondered exactly how hard a time he would have of it. Kabuto had informed him of Gara's status as the Jinchuriki of the one-tailed Tanuki Shukaku. This meant that in regards to power, his opponent was stronger than the average Jounin, and he would have to end this quickly. Trying to get the fight over with as fast as possible, he moved to the boy the instant the start of the fight was called and dislocated his limbs so the boy couldn't just throw him off when he wrapped himself around him as he did so. When he grabbed the boy in order to squeeze him to death or unconsciousness at the very least, it had probably looked like a weird sort of hug to everyone who had been watching since he'd gone for the front as the boy's back was covered by a giant gourd. As he tried to crush the boy, he could feel sand move under his arms. Suddenly, he felt himself flying away from the boy, his limbs ripping off and going in different directions as sand flew into his face, blinding him. There was more pain than he'd ever felt in his entire life and everything went black. After the tenth bout had ended and those who passed had lined up before him, Jeko Hei looked over the group of Jenin who had made it to the third phase of the exams. They were a strong bunch and would most likely go far. Soon, the Hokage finished his speech to the young shinobi that were arrayed before him and he went along the line with a box that contained the numbered slips of paper that would determine in which order the Jenin would fight. Once he reached the end and the last number had been taken, the candidates called out their numbers. 1. Hayuganiji called. 5. Aburam Shino called. 3. Rock Lee called. 4. The Suna Gen and Kankuro called. Do Yuzumaki Naruto called. 7. The Suna Gen and Tamari called. 6. Nara Shikamaru called. 9. Ichiha Sasu called. 10. The Suna Gen and Gara called. 8. Haruno Sakura called. The matches for the third phase of the summer Chunin exams will be.
Hayu Ganiji vs. Yuzumaki Naruto, Rock Lee vs. Kankuro, Abura Mishino vs. Nara Shikamaru, Tamari vs. Haruno Sakura, and Ichiha Sasuke vs. Gara. He announced after the last genin had called out her number. After the matches had been called, the preliminaries had ended and everyone including Kakashi had gone home. As he made his way into his apartment and tossed his vest onto a chair that was completely covered in dog hair, Kakashi sighed in relief that that ordeal was over. A moment later, he whirled and pulled out a kunai as he made his way to his mini school kitchen to attack the person who was sitting at his dining table without his leave. He then lowered the kunai when he saw exactly who it was that was sitting at his table, leafing through one of his few non itcha itcha books and chowing down on the leftovers he'd planned on having for dinner. Hello Jiraiya. He said. Long time no see. After greeting his sensei sensei, Kakashi pulled a beer out of his fridge and popped it open, wondering what the hell Jiraiya was doing in his kitchen after staying away from Kanoha and everyone in it for more than a decade. After several moments of thought, it finally hit him. You're taking Naruto aren't you? He asked, holding the open beer two inches away from his masked face, unheeding of the fact that it had begun to spill. I had planned on it, yes. Jiraiya replied, and in that moment, he felt an almost uncontrollable urge to murder his sensei sensei. Under Kanoha law, he could get away with it too, since the man had invaded his apartment uninvited. You do realize that I don't plan on handing him over. He told the man who had come into his home, eaten his dinner, and told him that he planned on taking Minato-sensei's son from him coldly. He knew that Jureya had the prior claim since he was the boy's godfather, appointed to the position by Minato-sensei and all. He even knew why the man had not fulfilled his responsibilities towards the boy until now, as it was the same reason he had hung back until Shimura had given him a legitimate reason to come forward. Even with that knowledge, the thought of the man taking Naruto away from him before he had a chance to connect with the boy enraged him. You do realize that you don't have a choice, much like that one guy what's his name didn't have a choice when you took Naruto from him. Jirei replied equally coolly, the look in his eyes, saying that if he tried to force the issue, he would smack him down hard. Naruto was meant to be he started. Naruto was meant to be his student. He had known that since the day he had first felt the boy kick while Kishina-san was pregnant with him. He'd almost forgotten it in the intervening years, but he had remembered when Shimura had taken the boy for himself. With you, yes I know. Jiraiya said. You clearly illustrated that when you took him without ever once consulting the boy about his feelings on the matter. He'll come around eventually. He replied. Naruto would come around eventually, even if he had to wait a long while. Naruto was his to train, his to mold as Minato-sensei had once done with him. He promised Minato-sensei well before Naruto was even born. Would you have come around if someone had snatched you from little Minato and demanded you call them sensei? Jiraiya asked, pushing his half-finished meal aside and looking at him seriously. That is hardly the... He started before Jiraiya cut him off again. It is the same. You took him away from a teacher he knew and loved just like family and tried to take the man's role, even though Naruto hadn't wanted you to. Jiraiya replied. I may have been far away, but I've always had eyes and ears on the boy. You plan on doing the same thing. He pointed out, as Jiraiya had already admitted to as much earlier. Not exactly. Jiraiya replied. Well I do plan on springing a little surprise on the boy, I'm going to make it clear that I know that his sensei is his sensei, and that his godfather can teach him a few tricks that his sensei doesn't know. If he tries to shove me off and tell me to go to hell, I'll back off him a bit and give him a little time and space. If you keep trying to squeeze him tighter, he's just going to struggle that much harder to escape. He scowled at this behind his mask. Jure always knew how to make him feel like a kid, and he felt very much like one later, after he chucked his half-full beer at the man and yelled at him to get out. It figured. Everyone else had been taken from him, so why not Naruto? The morning after the preliminaries, Naruto arrived at Team 7's meeting point as Kakashi had ordered in the missive that Pakin had arrived with earlier that morning. Sakura and then Sasuke showed up about a minute later coming from two different directions, indicating that Sakura hadn't gone through her usual morning stalking routine that morning. Kakashi showed up two hours late as usual. The fact that the man looked hungover was not normal however. Before Kakashi could say a word however, Kanohamaru's tutor bounded onto the scene. Sorry I'm late, the man whose name he thought might be Abisu said. The honorable grandson somehow managed to paint the Hokage's office orange, and the lecture I gave him ran longer than I had planned. The look on Kakashi's face at this statement was absolutely murderous. The reason why I called you here today. Kakashi said once Abisu had settled himself well away from the man who was quite possibly going to be having words with him later. Is because I have had to arrange alternate instruction, since I cannot train all three of you for the third phase of the exams. There were two potential instructors, and three of them. That meant. Yes. He was getting back with Tetsuo-sensei, finally. 
Adabisu here will be taking Sasuke, Kamizuki Suzum has agreed to train Sakura, and I will be taking Naruto. Kakashi finished. What? But Kakashi. He started. He had to act fast, or his chance to spend a month with Tetsuo Sensei would be gone. He would have to think of an argument quick. What is it Naruto? Kakashi asked. Wouldn't it make more sense for you to take Sasuke? He asked, having gotten his inspiration from the horrified look Sasuke had given Konohamaru's tutor. Both of you have the Sharingan, and Sasuke is a lightning affinity like you as well. Not only that, but Sasuke will be going up against a rather dangerous earth user who ripped that one guy apart. That does make sense Naruto, but... Kakashi started, clearly not willing to let him go. It was going to take a long argument to get rid of the man, and Sasuke really did need the training, so he wasn't entirely doing this for selfish reasons. While Team 7 met, Inuzuka Kiba sat at Hinata's bedside as he had done for the past hour and a half. The medics had had to restart her heart twice since the preliminaries. Somehow, Hinata had managed to pull through though and was in the ICU instead of the morgue. He had come to visit the instant the hospital allowed it, despite the fact that the girl was unconscious and he would stay by his teammate's bedside until she got better. He had nothing else to do and even if he did have something else to do, he would still have visited. It was a pity that Niji was untouchable at the moment due to the exams. If he tried to do anything to the other boy, Shino could be disqualified because of his interference since he was Shino's teammate. This little fact was only just barely holding him back from going up to Niji and ripping his balls off though. If Shino didn't get the bastard during the exams, he was going to murder him afterward. I didn't know why he even bothered lecturing Niji about his unyouthful and frankly somewhat psychotic actions during the preliminaries. The boy obviously hadn't been listening to him. Niji rarely listened to him when he tried to give him advice, unlike Lee. Lee was the perfect student and quite possibly a distant relative. Lee had been a great deal like him as a child. A hard-working boy who was called a loser and determined to prove he wasn't. Lee had put in all the hard work to get where he was today, obsessively training day after day after day. All of that hard work was finally starting to pay off for Lee, just as it had for him when he was Lee's age. A month from now, Lee would be proving to everyone that a person could be an exemplary shinobi with Tejutsu alone. Until that day came, he would train with Lee to prepare him for his coming ordeal and try to figure out what he was going to do with Niji, who would be training with his clan during the upcoming month. Niji would have to be dealt with soon however, since his being perceived as the sort who would attack comrades could completely ruin his career as a shinobi, and the whispers about what he had done to his cousin Hinata were already beginning to spread. The fact that his final attack took place after the fight had been declared over, and the fact that the Hinata girl was family, wasn't doing his student any favors either. Back at the Hayuga compound, Hayuga Hiyashi watched the video of the fight between his eldest daughter and his brother's son. He had been advised of Hinata's condition as a result of that fight earlier, when he had gone to visit his daughter at the hospital. Hinata had always been weak, and while he told himself it would be no great loss if she passed, and that it would solve the problem of who would be his heir, seeing her like that had hurt him deeply. She looked so much like her mother had in her final moments. Turning his attention to the video, he watched in surprise as the trembling and weak creature he knew suddenly grew determined and began to battle her older cousin, despite knowing the outcome in advance. He grew even more surprised when the girl rose after she lost, despite the fact that she had to be in almost unbearable agony and was quite likely suffering from a heart attack at that time. It would seem that Hinata wasn't so weak after all. Dureya observed his future apprentice from a distance as the boy argued with little Kakashi. He would have to find the most opportune time for them to meet, the time when his student son would be most inclined to accept his assistance. He couldn't just outright introduce himself as the boy's godfather, as that would raise some questions that he couldn't answer right now, thanks to a set of orders he'd received from his sensei long ago. The fact that the boy knew a little bit about his mother might help answer some of those questions though, as he had become the child's godfather with his mother's consent. Irizen sensei had sent him periodic updates on the boy while he'd been away from the village, so he knew much of what had been going on in the child's life over the years. He had also managed to send one or two presents to the child that he was certain couldn't be tracked back to him over the years as well. Now, once he found the opportune moment, he was going to be directly interacting with Naruto for the first time since he had been a newborn. As she left with Ibisu, Sakura honestly didn't know how the hell Naruto did it. Now, instead of one trainer for the third phase of the exams, she now had three. Suzum who had been working with her for the past couple of months, an elite tutor named Abisu who had owed Kakashi a favor, and possibly Kurenai who apparently would be having some free time on her hands, if what Abisu said when he mentioned the possibility of calling her in was true. What had happened was that Naruto had somehow managed to talk Kakashi into taking Sasuke as his student, and somehow managed to fast talk Abisu into taking her on at some point during the argument as well. 
The next thing she knew was that Ibisu had taken her off to evaluate her skills and had mentioned bringing in an acquaintance of his on occasion to possibly tutor her in Jinjutsu since she had almost perfect chakra control. All of these people who had arranged for her training and had been willing to train her obviously thought that she would succeed, otherwise they would not have decided to spend time working with her. She would have to do so in order to make sure that their time wasn't wasted. Despite the pressure this added, she would not let them down. Sasu growled as he packed enough supplies for a month-long trip after returning home from his team meeting. Kakashi was going to be taking him out for special training, but he was only doing it because that boy hadn't wanted the man to be training him. He remembered the look of panic on that boy's face when he started arguing for Kakashi to take him instead. As far as Kakashi was concerned, he was something to be thrown aside and that boy was the real prize. He didn't know why since he disliked the man but that realization really stung for some strange reason. Tetsuo had been about to lay his daughter down for a nap when he heard the excited pounding on the door. He went to open it and found a very welcome visitor on the doorstep. Hello, Tetsuo-sensei. Naruto said grinning from ear to ear. It had been nearing dinner time on the third day since Naruto had resumed his training with Tetsuo-sensei. They had gone down to the small nearby hot spring village to pick up his Mrs. Shimura, who had needed a day off when Tetsuo-sensei had noticed something that had seemed to be out of the ordinary. There's something I haven't seen since I was a kid. Brings back memories. Tetsuo-sensei muttered as he looked at whatever it was that had caught his attention. Turning to look in the direction in which his sensei was focused, he saw a white-haired pervert peeping into the women's side of the baths. Something about this stirred a vague memory, something about the people on his to prank list. As he watched, Tetsuo-sensei turned and walked over to the man with a mischievous grin on his face. Boy. Jiraiya. Tetsuo-sensei called out loudly once he was less than five feet from the man. The white-haired pervert who'd been peering through a hole in the fence whirled around quick as lightning and knocked Tetsuo-sensei to the ground, knocking him out cold. Oh wait, he didn't. Tetsuo-sensei didn't stiffen up like that when he was really unconscious. Oh goody, they were going to be pulling a con similar to the one that the team had once pulled in River Country after Satoshi lost their traveling funds, except this time it hadn't been him who had thrown himself under the horse or been attacked rather. Oh my god. Tetsuo-sensei. He yelled, running over to his fallen sensei. Tetsuo-sensei, are you alright? The expression on the white-haired pervert's face at this point was oh shit, what have I done? Perfect. Hook, line, and sinker. He's still unconscious. He yelled while Tetsuo-sensei continued to play dead. You might have given him brain damage. I'm going to go and report this as soon as I find a medic. Based on the pervert's panicked expression, he could confidently say that he just reeled him in. Should he actually go to the authorities that dealt with shinobi on shinobi crimes, the white-haired pervert would be found to be in the wrong, since there was a witness who could truthfully say for a fact that the white-haired pervert had been the first to attack. Had Tetsuo-sensei say, attacked him, then there would have been no issue. But, since it would be two on one to say that the white-haired pervert had attacked Tetsuo-sensei just for saying hello. Well, add in the possibility of a female mediator and the fact that the pervert had been occupied with peeping on the women's baths at the time of the attack and the man was screwed. There would be a fine and a mark on the man's record at the very least. At worst, he could receive jail time and dismissal from the ranks if he was still active. Please don't. The man who knew he was screwed pleaded. I'll give you anything. Based on the pervert's actions, he was quite likely one black mark away from dismissal from the ranks or one charge away from serving several years of hard time, which was rather fortunate for him. Now, it was time for the most critical part of the con. If he didn't get this right, he just wasted the time of all three of them. Satoshi was a much better actor than him though and would have had a much better chance of pulling this off. He was going to have to try though and hope the mark never caught on. He did his best to look as if he'd completely rejected the offer, got up, leaving Tetsuo-sensei's side, and started walking away. As he moved, he started looking as if he were generously considering the offer. He then heaved a sigh. I really shouldn't be doing this but what have you got on you? He said. This was the part that would make or break the con. It seemed to have made it however since the man had started listing a bunch of useless things. It was time to put pressure on him to make him go for the valuables. Please hurry, I need to get a medic for Tetsuo-sensei. He said trying to sound worried about his sensei's condition despite the fact that he was standing here shaking the white-haired pervert down instead of getting a medic like he should be doing. The man listed the amount of money he had on him, his checkbook, and a toad summoning contract. Bingo. Summoning contracts were extremely rare and carefully guarded by the shinobi who managed to acquire them. Usually the guardians of said contracts only let students that they'd been training for years and trusted implicitly sign them. About that summoning contract. He said. The man was apparently still rather desperate not to be arrested. You want to sign the contract? 
I let you sign the contract. The man said as he pulled the aforementioned contract off his back and unrolled it. I'll even teach you how to summon toads later as well. He made sure to be hesitant and properly reverent, as if he wasn't sure he should be doing this as he reached towards the aforementioned contract. It wasn't all that hard to do so since there was a niggling suspicion in the back of his mind that it had been all too easy. Maybe why it seemed so was because it was more than likely that the man would skip out on the actual summoning lessons. Oh well, Kakashi had the dog contract and would be able to teach him the basics. While the particulars of summoning differed depending on the animal, there was some basic commonality for all summons. You sign it in blood kid. The pervert said when he moved for a writing implement. He complied, putting his name and a set of bloody fingerprints down in the space right next to that of one Namakis Minato, which, if he remembered correctly, had been the name of the Yandame. Well, now that that's taken care of. The man said as he refurled the scroll and turned to leave bye-bye. Tetsuo-sensei got up as soon as the man was gone. Good job Naruto, Tetsuo-sensei said. But, do you know that signing that contract will be absolutely useless without? I'm not that stupid. He replied. Kakashi has the dog summoning contract, he'll teach me the basics and I'll figure it out how from there. If I didn't know where I would be able to find a teacher, I'd have shook him for cash. Ureya chuckled to himself as he watched Naruto and his sensei from a hidden perch nearby. He couldn't wait to see the little con artist's reaction when he found out exactly what he'd signed himself up for. He knew that it was going to come as a slightly nasty shock to the boy, but then again, the brat should not have tried to con him like that. He'd been avoiding cons like those for years and knew how to spot them from a mile off. Now that his business here was done, he was going to head over to the tower and register his new apprentice. The boy would be his for five years, but unlike Kakashi who had tried to keep a stranglehold on him, he knew to give the child space and allow him to visit with his sensei. While many would have called him irresponsible for not raising his godson as he had agreed to do should something happen to little Minato and his wife, leaving little Naruto behind, had been one of the most responsible and heart-wrenching choices he had ever made. Gureya protectively cradled the small bundle close to his chest. This had not been what he had in mind when he'd been named godfather to the child who had been named after a character in his book months earlier, but he was willing. He knew how to feed a baby and change diapers, thanks to numerous deer-ranked missions that had been taken in his youth, and was confident that he could still do so, even though it had been more than two decades since he had last done so. Even though he had wanted to be the cool uncle who showed up on occasion and spoiled the kid rotten, he was willing to drop everything to be Naruto's parent. Think about this Jiraiya. His sensei said. I'd gladly let you raise Minato's son if it were safe, but people are going to see that you have a blonde-haired blue-eyed child with you, put the facts together, and come after the child if he is with you. You can't always be there to protect him, and it would only take just once for something tragic to happen. It would be better for him if nobody knew exactly whose child he was, and I've taken steps to make it far more difficult for them to find out. I could dye his hair. He said. Even the temporary hair dyes we use are harmful to babies. His sensei replied. Would you really risk the boy's health and safety because of your own selfishness? He knew his sensei was being logical, but his heart didn't want to accept what the man was saying. It was too painful. He'd lost so much, and now he would lose Naruto too. Coming back to train Naruto was the least he could do for the boy he'd unwillingly left behind long ago. Well, he would have to work around the fact that Naruto had a sensei he cared for and wasn't about to give up and wasn't about to be given up by again, and the fact that Kakashi was clinging to the boy like a limpet that refused to be pried off, he would find a way to make it work. He had to in order to make it up to the boy for being gone so long. Instead of going home for the day as he'd been about to do when Jiraiya had turned up in his office, Third Hokage looked over the application his student had handed him. While he was tempted to say no, there was the fact that Naruto was no longer a small child and could now look after himself as well. Naruto had proven himself capable of going up against an A-ranked missing nin in the recent past, so that reduced the number of potential dangers to the boy quite a bit from the time he was a baby. Jiraiya had even found a reasonable and somewhat logical explanation for why he was taking Naruto as his apprentice that had nothing whatsoever to do with who Naruto's father was, so if anyone looked, they wouldn't get their answer from the application. He would have liked to allow his student to have taken Naruto in as a baby, but he had known that it wouldn't have been feasible considering. Jiraiya had been running the intelligence network that was keeping tabs on Orochimaru, and the fact that the man had been Namikaze's sensei had been a well-known fact. If anyone had seen a blonde child with him, suspicions would have immediately been raised, and any number of children would have tried to kill the child just in case. Now, Naruto was old enough to be able to look after himself, and people probably wouldn't immediately associate him with his father, other than to note a vague resemblance, as besides coloring, the boy took after his mother's side of the family very strongly. Smiling, he added his signature and stamp of approval to the form. 
Naruto would be able to learn a great deal from young Jiraiya, as the two had been very much alike when they had first started out in their lives, so Jiraiya was probably the one teacher who could best understand him. After weaseling his signature onto the Toad Summoning Scroll, retrieving Mrs. Shimura with Tetsuo-sensei, and going with them when they picked up the baby form her mother's, Naruto stopped by the hospital to visit Hinata on his way home. She was still unconscious when he arrived. Kiba was sitting by her bed, and Akamaru was curled up next to her whining slightly. He felt guilty as he gazed upon the tableau they made. This was his fault. If he hadn't encouraged her to fight a much stronger opponent, she would have simply curled up on herself and bowed out unharmed except for her pride. Instead, she had fought, she had lost, and now she was just barely clinging to life. After watching Hinata and her teammate for a while, he entered the room and took the other chair beside Hinata's bed. He half expected Kiba to growl and chase him out for what he had done to his teammate when he did, but he didn't do so. Instead, the other boy moved to give him more room. Hey Hinata. He said, as he picked up the hand that Kiba had apparently set on Akamaru. You won't believe the day I had. As the unresponsive girl lay there, he told her the story of how he and Tetsuo-sensei had tricked some white-haired pervert into allowing him to sign his summoning scroll, even though he was pretty sure that she couldn't hear him. It had been his fault that she had gotten hurt and he would be there for her until she got better and do whatever it took to make it up to her when she did. Naruto had been going over the finer points of his plan for dealing with his first match during the third phase of the exams with Tetsuo-sensei namely, don't let Niji get close enough to touch him. And use things that don't require chakra if he does when the white-haired pervert that Tetsuo-sensei had informed him was named Jiraiya and was apparently one of a group of three legendary ninja who had trained under the old man Hokage before the second war showed up. What are you doing here? He asked as he looked up from the information he and Tetsuo-sensei had managed to get on the Juken in order to better form their strategy. I had a little spare time and thought I'd drop by and teach you how to summon toads. Jiraiya said, going into some over-the-top pose as he did so. What was it with ninja and drama? It was like they were deliberately trying to be contrary or something. You're told all through the academy that a ninja was not meant to be noticed and that there should be almost no sign of your passing and just as soon as you graduate and before then even. Well, there was Abusa and his flying sword trek, the exam proctors, and there suddenly appearing in a cloud of smoke due to several simultaneous shunshins, there was Anko flying in through a window and flinging a banner, there was Mido Guy's dynamic entry, and there was this guy. Sure, a dramatic entrance could knock an enemy off balance and cause them to over or underestimate you depending on the situation, but it was also a good way to get yourself killed since you've just pulled yourself away from any available cover and completely ruined the element of surprise. Great. He said semi-excitedly once he'd finished internally grumbling about ninja and unnecessary drama. It seemed that the pervert he finally remembered to have been the one who had ogled Suzum in the mixed baths that one time was actually holding to his word. That didn't mean that he wasn't going to prank him for upsetting Suzum though. He'd be taking care of that just as soon as the man finished teaching him how to summon toads. Toad summoning would actually be useful for his fight during the third phase of the exams, as he could use the creatures as some sort of distraction while he set his traps and goaded the Hyuga bastard into them. Niji would probably shit himself if he found himself facing a monster toad the size of the one that the Yandame had ridden into battle against the Kaiubi. There was a picture of the thing in one of the history books he'd found in the library, and if he found himself looking up at one of those, he'd want to run himself. Since he wasn't the Yandame, chances were that he'd only manage get some sort of medium-sized toad however, but a few of those would be rather useful. For the next few hours, while Tetsuo-sensei stood aside and watched, the pervert went over the basics of toad summoning. Several miles away from Naruto and his toad summoning lesson, Sasuke growled at his teacher. It was the closest he had come to speaking to the man over the last four days. That day, like every other day, the man had woken him up at an insanely early hour, ran him through a training routine from hell, and yet he expected more out of him. You know, that attitude problem of yours is the reason you didn't graduate early like Naruto did. Kakashi said, casually leaning against a tree with his nose buried in his perverted book as he had been doing for the last hour. What? He yelled, stunned by Kakashi's little revelation. Your attitude and apparent superiority complex which you seem to have inherited from your father was seen as potentially disruptive. Kakashi said calmly as he turned a page. The fact that an early graduation would have placed you on a team with older genin would have been disruptive enough. Kakashi continued, still reading that book. The addition of your rather atrocious attitude would almost certainly have sparked a number of power struggles within your team as the older genin tried to maintain a dominant position, which would have resulted in a great deal of infighting, which would have had catastrophic effects on any mission such a team would be assigned to, as has happened with similar teams before. 
it was decided that unless your attitude improved, you would remain with your initial graduating class, since the members of that class would be able to compensate for and work around your behavior, since they were already accustomed to dealing with it. Over the following years, your attitude got worse instead of better, and here we are, with you causing trouble as predicted. The Kashi casually concluded as he turned another page. After listening to the Haddock's listing of his failings, he sat there stunned. The only reason he hadn't graduated with that boy, or possibly even before him as he should have, was because somebody thought he had an attitude problem. An attitude problem. Well now, 10 more laps, and try to improve your time, as this is an exercise for increasing speed as well as stamina. If you're going to knock off guys students routine like you tried to do during our spar yesterday, you'll need both. Kakashi said lazily, gesturing toward the track he'd worn into the grass over the last couple of days. Over in the Hyuga compound, Niji continued his solitary training, ignoring the strangeness of the last few days. Instead of the usual reverent treatment he got from the other branch house members and the words of encouragement that accompanied it, everyone seemed to be dodging him, as if they didn't want to be associated with him for some strange reason. It was probably because they thought that he would be up for punishment for what he had done to that loser Hinata during the preliminaries. While there was an awful lot of bad blood between the main and branch houses, there was no outright conflict besides the occasional argument. The reason for this was simple, the main house held the lives of all of the branch house members in their hands. As children, each branch house member was marked with a seal which could seriously hurt or even kill them when activated by a member of the main house. He'd learned about the pain the hard way early on, when his uncle had activated his seal for merely looking at Hinata the wrong way several years ago. It still felt strange however to receive fearful glances from his branch house relatives as his family skirted him in the halls instead of approaching him and asking him how he was doing or how his training was going or providing words of encouragement in regards to his future performance in the third phase of the exams. Oh well, such was fate and if it was his fate to be shunned, then so be it. Ara smiled faintly when the man named Tucci welcomed him with a smile and handed him his usual. Over the last couple of weeks, he'd apparently become a regular enough customer that the man already remembered his preferred order the instant he saw him. As always, the food wasn't the best, but the company was to die for. When he was halfway finished with his meal, a brown-haired chunin with a scar across his nose sat down next to him. After giving him the usual initial once-over that he got from all shinobi who weren't native to Suna, the man simply went on with his life without showing any fear beyond the small amount of caution one gives a foreign stranger. It was unusual to him since the expressions he got at home were of varying degrees of terror, and the ones he got when he encountered foreign shinobi during a mission usually swiftly morphed into the same. He wasn't used to it being otherwise, and he didn't like the feeling of being ignored like this, the feeling that his existence didn't matter one way or another to the person who was sitting next to him. He could feel his anger rising as the man continued to ignore him, but before it could get to the point where he would actually kill the man and quite possibly ruin some plans that had been in the works for months, something distracted him. Hey, Gar was it? How's it going? A familiar voice called out as a certain blonde moved to sit next to the Chunin, and a brown-haired man of average height with dark eyes that looked to be a Jounin sat next to the blonde. Not okay. He finally replied. Good. The blonde who seemed to have been somewhat aptly named after a Raymond Topping, considering how much of the stuff he ate said before greeting the scarred Chunin who was apparently Aruka-sensei and answering the two men's questions about how he and Gara met. Instead of leaving him out of the conversation with the two men whom Naruto knew well, Naruto had tried to include him in it. As he sat there eating, he wasn't being ignored as he almost had been before Naruto had arrived, and he wasn't being looked at with a challenging expression the way many had looked at him before they realized his true strength or with the expressions of abject terror that his fellow villagers usually bore when they encountered him. Instead, he was being treated as an acquaintance, and it was odd, and he wasn't exactly sure how he felt about it. After several hours of training, Sakura flopped to the ground gasping for breath. She had known all of the basics from the academy and thought she was good, but Ibisu was on a whole nother level. This man had taken the academy basics and turned them into an art. Not only that, but the man had a bunch of other tricks up his sleeve she'd never even imagined, and he intended on teaching her a number of them over the coming month. She could see why the man was considered to be an elite tutor, and she felt honored to be learning from him. We'll work on that Jinjutsu exercise Kurunai san demonstrated yesterday. The man said after she had rested a while and gotten her breath back. Yes, Ibisu sensei. Sakura said, standing despite the fact that she was exhausted. She was going to do everything in her power to prove to the man that she wasn't wasting the time he had devoted to her when he could be doing other more important things. She was going to grow stronger and pass the third phase of the exams and show all of the people who had taken the time to teach her that their time hadn't been wasted. Over on one of the training grounds, Lee kicked his practice stump for the 600th time. 
He was training harder than usual for the third phase in the exams. He was going to be up against a puppet user during the first match, which meant that he was practically going to get two opponents instead of one right off the bat. And, if he defeated the puppet user, he would get a chance to fight Niji and show everyone what a genius of hard work could do against a true genius during the second round. He would have to train really hard in order to be his best for that day. Fortunately, since Niji had wandered off to train on his own somewhere, Guy Sensei was there to help him every step of the way. Good work Lee. Guy Sensei said as he continued his warm up, shifting to his other leg. Thanks, Guy Sensei. He replied as he started counting kicks for his left leg. He didn't know what he would have done if Guy Sensei hadn't been there for him since before he graduated the academy. Probably dropped out of the ninja program altogether, believing that his academy nickname of hot blooded loser was accurate and gone on to have a mediocre career in the food service industry. Fortunately, he never had to find out however since Guy Sensei was there for him and would always be there for him the way he was now, smiling and encouraging him as he worked his way to new heights despite the pain. In the hospital, Hinata winced at the pain she felt as she awoke. As she came to, she could feel something warm, fuzzy, and breathing under one of her hands. She was pretty sure that it was Akamaru since she knew from experience that the dog had a pretty unique coat texture that was not quite coarse or soft. She had learned this when Kiba had allowed her to brush the dog on a few special occasions after they had become teammates. Considering how protective Kiba had been of Akamaru at the academy, that had been quite the sign of trust. When she opened her eyes, the light nearly blinded her. Eventually though, her eyes managed to adjust to the relatively dim hospital illumination. The first thing she noticed when she'd finally adapted to the light that she'd been without for so long while she had been unconscious was the bouquet on the nightstand. Apparently, someone had given her flowers. She had a difficult time trying to translate the meaning behind the bouquet until she realized that the flowers had been selected for color instead of meaning, since the predominant color was orange, despite the rather unpleasant meanings of some of the flowers. The second thing she noticed was that the person she'd sensed was sitting by her bed wasn't Kiba as she'd expected since she was petting his dog, it was her father. After realizing that her father was sitting at her bedside, she briefly wondered what he was doing there, before realizing that it was more than likely because he wanted to chastise her for being weak and failing to defeat Niji Niasen once again. I am as sorry father. She said once she found her voice. She knew that the apology wasn't enough though. It would never be enough, just as she would never be good enough no matter how hard she tried because she would always fail. There is nothing to apologize for Hinata. Her father said, before patting her on the head in a way she vaguely remembered from when she was very little, and leaving the room. Had that really happened? It couldn't have, could it? She must still be dreaming. It must be the result of the pain medication that was undoubtedly in the IV that was connected to her arm. There was no way hell that her father would have let her go without a lecture on every last one of her failings as a high uga and as his daughter. What did you just say? Zabuza asked, hoping to God that he'd misheard his wife. This couldn't be happening. Not yet. It was way too soon. They'd only just gotten married a little more than a month ago for heaven's sake. I'm pregnant. May repeated. He hadn't misheard his wife as he'd been desperately hoping he had done. He was going to be a father, despite the fact that he wasn't ready and would never be ready. He wasn't cut out for this kind of life. He had been made for a life of action and adventure, not changing diapers. He didn't even know how to change diapers since he'd never gotten a babysitting job during the four deer ranks he'd taken as a genin before they'd handed him C's because nobody wanted to trust him with anything that didn't involve killing. He honestly wasn't ready to face the fact that in eight months or so, he'd be responsible for a small thing that screamed, wet and crapped itself, and he didn't think that he ever would be. Haku on the other hand was standing there grinning like an idiot, apparently happy at this turn of events. Well, it wasn't Haku that was going to be the parent, and it wasn't Haku who was going to be responsible for the care and feeding of the impending bundle of doom. After the wedding, May had made it quite clear what she would do to him if he tried to foist all of the childcare duties off onto his loyal follower. Congratulations, Zabuza Sama. Haku said much too cheerfully for his tastes. That settled it. He was going to find a wife for Haku, a wife that was willing to have lots and lots of babies, and they'd see who had the last laugh then. Sasuke was somewhat surprised when he woke up to find the sun already in the sky. Usually, Kakashi would wake him up at some insanely early hour for more of the training from hell. As he looked at the already risen sun, he wondered at the feeling that today was important somehow, but for the life of him, he couldn't think of why. It was as he was counting the number of days that he'd trained with Kakashi that he realized what it was. Today was the day of the third phase of the Chunin exams, and if they didn't get a move on, they'd be late. When the realization had finally sunk in, he shot out of his sleeping bag as if it were filled with flaming scorpions, raced out of the tent as if the very hounds of hell were on his heels, and went searching for Kakashi. 
there was no way in hell he was going to show up three hours late for something as important as the final phase of the Chumin exams. After searching for several minutes, he finally found Kakashi lounging in a tree, reading one of his ever-present pornographic novels. We've got to get out of here now or we'll be late. He yelled up to the man, relieved that he hadn't disappeared altogether as he was occasionally wont to do. Late for what? Kakashi asked lazily, not even bothering to look up from his book. Late for the Chunin exams. He replied. Whoops. Looks like I picked the wrong day to finally give you a day off. Kakashi said as he closed his book and dropped from the tree after tallying something up on his fingers. He couldn't tell if the man was being serious or not, since Kakashi had a really twisted sense of humor, and it was sometimes rather hard to tell whether or not the man was joking. Deciding not to bother wasting any more time trying to determine whether or not Kakashi had actually been serious, he dashed over to the campsite, wondering if they had time to pack their supplies. In the end, he decided to do so anyways, since there was no point in leaving stuff out where just about anybody could take it. More than one ninja had scored free supplies due to the carelessness of others in the past. He knew this for a fact, since he'd seen that boy scrounging for kunai and other unattended weapons on the practice fields when he was running low. As there wasn't really any time, he decided to sacrifice neatness for speed and haphazardly threw everything within reach into his bag. In his office in the administration complex, the Hokage side as a final guest arrived as he was preparing to depart to the local arena that was going to be home to the third phase of the Chunin exams. Scheduling for the event had initially been a nightmare, as he'd had to work with the game's schedule for Konoha's ninjutsu team, which had had an important match scheduled for today, as the playing season schedule had been drawn up well before the lots had been drawn up for the locations of this year's exams. In the end, he'd been forced to give VIP seating and free snacks to the Konoha Tigers, who were in charge of the arena when it was not in use for the exams, in order to get them to forfeit today's match against the Fire Country Lions, who had also had to be given VIP seating for the event. Competitive ninjutsu was a popular sport in the elemental countries, with each country fielding at least one team and each ninja village fielding a team of their own as well. Most members of the professional teams were retired shinobi, but trained civilians who had either failed the academy or learned from relatives who had gone on to become ninja could be found on the teams as well, as there were rules against active duty ninja competing in such tournaments. Competitive ninjutsu was pretty much what its name suggested, ninjutsu against ninjutsu, and the best ninjutsu wins. Points were also given and taken for evasive ability and creative use of terrain or lack thereof. Bouts were either singles or team trials and could last for several hours at a stretch. Some of the flashier moves first seen in the arena had found their way onto the battlefield on occasion over the years, such as the Ichiha's Grand Fireball Jutsu, which had previously merely been a jutsu that had been used to mark a certain rite of passage before it had been popularized by a top professional player from that clan sometime around the founding of the village. He'd been torn from his musings on competitive ninjutsu that he'd been lost in as he grabbed his hat and got up to go in order to be on time for the opening ceremonies when Danzo had walked into his office with some last-minute paperwork. Great. Just what he'd needed to start his day. Danzo, since the intelligence department seems to be your home away from home, maybe you could shed some light on why rumors about an Asugaku which is supposedly located beneath Konoha have been making their way around the academy. He said mildly as he signed a supply requisition form that had requested a couple hundred more kunai than the unit that was officially under Danzo's command would need in a year. Village hidden in the sewage. Danzo replied as he took the form back. Other than the fact that children tend to come up with the most unusual things, I don't know. In the quarters that were set aside for visiting dignitaries, Orochimaru sighed as he arranged the Kazakija's robes once more. He didn't quite feel comfortable wearing the things and understood why the brat who had taken the position that should rightfully have been his had ditched them in favor of a jacket. Honestly, they reminded him of the time he'd gone around in a dress after losing a bet to Jiraiya, whom he was firmly convinced had cheated somehow. The fact that he was wearing his usual attire under the robes made things worse, as it was the hottest part of August and this year was no exception. He was dreading setting foot outside. Well, the cage box at the arena would be both shaded and air-conditioned thanks to a number of near-invisible seals, the route to the arena and future battlefield where he would be fighting his former sensei was not. Normally, this wouldn't be too much trouble for him since he was acclimated to Konoha's weather, having spent most of the first 40 years of his life here, but today he was wearing far more layers than usual. In addition to his normal attire that consisted of underclothing, some armor, and his usual summer battle wear, he was wearing a long robe and an overcoat. He would have been over warm and all this during the winter, but as it was summer, it was going to be a rather hellish walk. Bracing himself, he stepped out of the special quarters that had been reserved for visiting Cage and into what had to be a furnace, if the sudden blast of hot air that hit him as soon as he was out the door was any indication. 
He wondered how he was going to keep from sweating and giving himself away by doing so, since this would be nothing for the real Kazakiage, as Suna was worse, much worse. At the other end of the village from the much too warmly bundled Orochimaru, Naruto sighed as he made his way to the arena. All he'd heard in the streets was speculation about the performances Sasuke and Niji were going to give today, and hopes for a Sasuke-Niji fight during the final round. Those who hadn't been able to score an arena seat would be able to watch the final phase of the exams on a screen that had been set up outside and would be able to catch the events in full or special highlights of the coming events at the local theater for the next month or so. There was an almost palpable air of excitement in the village as Konoha had not scored the more desirable and better attended summer slot in a good long time. While winters in Konoha were relatively mild, many of the lords who attended the final phase of the exams did not enjoy traveling during that season, as a sizable number of them had to make their way over treacherous snowy passes and Watnet to even get to fire country. The excited air eased his tense mood somewhat, especially after his old team had dropped by to wish him luck that morning and inform him that they'd be in the stands rooting for him. They'd had no doubts whatsoever that he could pass, and he had few doubts that he would pass as well. He'd gotten this far, and all he had to do now was kick everyone else's ass, starting with that bastard Niji. He just hoped he wouldn't look like an ass to the audience and later generations who would be seeing his performance while doing so. The white-haired pervert Ureya had shown him the film of his own performance during the exam finals before he vanished to wherever the hell he went when he wasn't teaching him summoning or trying to convince him to let some of that damn fox out and he hadn't laughed that hard in a long time. That wasn't exactly how he wanted himself to be remembered though. He wanted future generations to see how cool their hokage had been as a kid when they studied him in history, not laugh at how stupid their hokage had looked while fighting. At Ichiraku Raymond, Gara hastily drained his bowl as he prepared to leave for the arena in which the third phase of the exams would be taking place. This was quite possibly the last time he would see the old man who ran the Raymond stand and his daughter. He tried to order for them to be kidnapped prior to the invasion, but Baki had countermanded his order, and Baki would of course be paying for that after this bothersome invasion was over. While it was still possible that the old man would be taken and brought to Suna after the invasion was over and they and their allies won, there was still the distinct possibility that the small family would die before that could happen. He'd been on the edge all week and suffering from withdrawal since he'd not been allowed to kill anyone for the past month and these little visits to Ichiraku had helped him center himself and hold on until the time was right and he could unleash the demon he contained, whether it be Biju or an evil monk as his people had believed it to be. When he attempted to pay his tab after he'd finished his raiment that day, the old man told him that the bowl was on the house since he was a friend of Naruto before he wished him luck in the exams. The man had given him free food. The man had given him free food and not in a here, now please don't kill me manner. That had never happened to him before. As he made his way to the arena, he tried to figure out what he felt about it. He knew that hadn't felt this since his uncle had passed and didn't have a name for it. Whatever it was called, it wasn't entirely painful. In a different section of Konoha, Shikamaru sighed and muttered troublesome as he and his father made their way to the arena. Personally, he'd much rather be at home, but he knew that he'd never hear the end of it if he skipped this, and that would of course be more troublesome than just showing up, giving up. And getting it over with since he'd be hearing it from his usually rather laid-back father as well. His father who was following his mother's orders and making sure he arrived was nursing a hangover because the man had gone out with his old teammates and gotten completely smashed the night before. When he'd gone to pick the man up from the restaurant, it had been while his father had been in the middle of sharing one of the more embarrassing stories of the original Ino Shikacho team with another one of his friends. While learning new things was almost always interesting, he had not wanted to know that when his father and his teammates were genin, people kept mistaking Yamanaka-san for a girl, since the usual makeup of the genin team was two males to one female. And that the man had been pursued by a particularly stubborn older genin for more than three months before he had finally snapped and dropped his trousers in a rather crowded public area. This morning had gone well enough though, making up for the embarrassment of the evening before. Both Eno and Chaoji had stopped by to wish him luck. Not that he really needed it though. He was still debating on exactly when he planned on giving up. In another part of Konoha, Lee's heart pounded in excitement as he raced towards the arena and his future. Guy Sensei was keeping pace alongside him as he ran. This was it. This was the big one. This was the day he'd prove himself to everyone. There would be no more hot-blooded loser. There would be Rock Lee, Chunin of Konoha and the next Green Beast. In the quarters that had been the Suna team's home for the last month and change, Kenkuro slung Karasu across his back. His heart hammered in his chest as he prepared to depart. Today was the day. Finally, after months of planning and a tense month of waiting and hoping that Gara didn't snap and either kill him or find some other way and everything, it had come. Looking at Tamari, he could see that his older sister looked just as nervous as he felt. She knew too. 
Today was the day, and it was too late to go back. Today, they would go to war. Naruto's heart pounded as he looked up at the crowd that was seated far above him. It seemed to take an eternity before his match was announced, and everyone else in line was dismissed and sent to wait in the competitor's box until their matches were called. Finally, after what seemed like forever and yet no time at all, he was facing Hai Uganiji and waiting for the proctor to start the fight. A few heartbeats later, Shiranyui Genma called for them to begin. The instant after the match had officially started, he summoned a few shadow clones before darting towards the trees in order to set traps that would take advantage of the terrain, leaving a pair of clones behind to test the Hayuga's reflexes and alter his traps accordingly. He was holding the toads he'd learned to summon in reserve as they would make an effective hidden wildcard if he were backed into a corner since few people knew he'd signed the contract. The pervert Jiraiya had been convinced that he would have been able to summon the boss Gamabunta if he'd just used the Kaiubi's power during the summoning lessons, but he had refused since the potential consequences were too great. There was no way he was going to let any more of that fox out of the seal. Who knew what would happen if he did or whether it weakened the seal every time he did so. Though he was unable to summon Gamabunta and would likely be unable to do so for a good long while, he was however able to summon some rather large toads, which he could use as a distraction if he needed to without resorting to taking more of the Kaiubi's unfiltered chakra. As he'd known going into the fight, Niji was strong and fast, and leading him into his traps would be like hurting cats, especially considering the fact that the Byakugan had a near-perfect 360-degree view. In order to do so, he would have to wear him down until he was too worn out to use the Byakugan while avoiding him completely, which was pretty much what he'd figured he'd have to do considering the information he'd gathered on the Hyuga. Even with his amazing reserves and stamina, it was going to be tough because he would have to make sure he didn't get hit. If he got hit by any of Niji's Juken strikes, it would be very bad for him because if his chakra got cut off, there was little he would be able to do despite his amazing chakra reserves. If his chakra were cut off by the Hyuga's gentle fist, he would be forced to depend on his traps, which would only work if the other boy became careless. Keeping this in mind, he summoned and sent in a few more clones to soften the other boy up a bit more as he shifted elsewhere outside of his opponent's range, watching the clones in hopes of finding Niji's blind spot. Faced with the near-overwhelming numbers his cage bunshin had provided, Niji went into some sort of spin, emitting chakra as he did so, and sent the clones and the weapons they threw flying in all directions. Whatever this was, it hadn't been in his information on the Hyuga. In order to end this fight, he would have to probe it for weaknesses. Anyone who knew Hyuga Hiyashi would have realized that his expression of mild surprise at the sight of Niji doing the Katen was tantamount to an expression of stupefied shock on anyone else. The Katen had been passed down the line of the main branch from parent to child in secret for generations. Neither of his daughters were yet ready to learn the Katen, and yet Niji had somehow managed to reverse engineer and teach himself the technique after watching him. He'd known his brother's son was a genius, but he hadn't known that he was on that level. It was only natural really, considering the fact that his Ashi had been better than him at just about everything. It had only been a cruel trick of fate that had made him head of and therefore responsible for the well-being of the clan and his brother, who would have been the better leader a member of the branch house. In the arena below the spectators who were reasonably safe behind barriers that would prevent stray jutsu from wreaking havoc by accidentally killing a number of VIPs, Naruto evaded Niji who had barely avoided the trap that he had herded the boy towards, as he eluded him, in hopes of gaining more information on the odd and seemingly impenetrable technique that the older boy was employing. So far, that odd spinning technique didn't have any holes that he could find, and he and his clones had attacked it from all angles he could think of. The only upside to his practically wasted effort so far though was that Niji was wearing out just that much faster each time he used the technique. Perhaps if he used a jutsu rather than a physical attack. After the thought finally hit, he started preparing a wind jutsu while the Hyuga boy was still distracted and he had the opportunity to do so. He knew that he could have done this jutsu or any other for that matter when Niji hadn't been spinning around like a top, but he had been curious to find out if the unusual defense that his opponent was using was truly impregnable. Such knowledge would be useful to both him and the Hyuga clan in the future, as if he could find and exploit such a weakness if any, then someone else could, and that could cost a Hyuga quite likely this one their life in the future. Puitan. Kazakiri no Jutsu. He called out after making the requisite hand seals for the attack. He wasn't quite proficient enough with the Jutsu that he could drop the name as he did the attack, as the Jutsu's name was a focus of sorts, kinda like an extra hand seal. After enough practice, he could start dropping a number of seals and eventually the name of the attack itself. Eventually, he would be able to master it to the point that he would be able to call it up with little more than a thought, but that was years and possibly even decades down the line. 
As soon as the final seal had been made and the attack called, the resulting blade of wind flew towards the whirling Niji and parted as it met his chakra shield. Seeing as that hadn't worked, he would have to think of something else. Perhaps if he created a counterspin. His twister shot wasn't all that good, as he hadn't had much opportunity to practice it, but it probably would work for his current purposes. Upon deciding on a course of action, he did the requisite hand seals and blew out a small tornado of wind lace chakra that spun in the opposite direction of Niji's, whatever the hell it was. Both techniques collided, wind blew in all directions, nearly knocking him over as it ripped up plants around him, and a massive cloud of dust formed. When the dust cleared, Niji was on his ass with a rather stunned look on his face. Apparently, the counterspin had negated Niji's rotation as it had been meant to do. Niji quickly recovered, got up, and made his way towards him, looking almost completely uninjured and as stoic as usual, despite the fact that he'd been picked up and dropped by a miniature tornado. Despite the fact that Niji appeared to be in near-perfect health, the attack apparently wasn't a total failure, as it had illustrated a weakness in the boy's technique and softened him up a bit. Now that the boy had stopped spinning, it was time to send in the clones to soften him up even further. Since the boy obviously had a temper, if his behavior at the end of his match with Hinata during the preliminaries was any indication, a bit of battle banter might be in order to make him lash out and make a critical mistake. The boy was close to one of his better and more vicious non-lethal traps, if he could just push him into it. You know how you were going off on Hinata for being a failure, and how it was her fate to lose. One of the clones who'd apparently been thinking along the same lines as he had been said. Well, look who fate decided was the loser now. Not only am I going to win, I'm going to kick your ass for what you did to Hinata. Nobody hurts my friends, much less tries to kill one of them in front of me. I swear, there has to be something seriously wrong with you if you're willing to pull an Itachi in public. Many civilians especially those from outside the village might have been puzzled by the last, but he knew that Niji knew full well what he was saying and therefore would be extremely offended by the accusation, since in the years since the Ichiha massacre, pulling an Itachi had become slang for killing members of one's own family. Rather than reacting in a manner that would be expected of a ninja who'd just basically been called a clan killer to his face and trying to rip either his head or his balls or both off, Niji responded to this by going into a long lecture about fate, which included a story about why he hated his cousin so much. Throughout the lecture that included a listing of exactly why Hinata was supposedly a total loser and anyone whom she befriended couldn't be that much better, especially a clanless orphan, he carefully nudged the boy towards the trap he'd been hoping to get the other boy to charge into in a mindless fury. Since Niji seemed so preoccupied with his tail, it seemed that his little plan would succeed despite the rather unusual setback. Man, you're a total asshole. He said when Niji had finished his story which included a bit of show and tell involving a seal. What gives you the right to decide who is and isn't a loser and tell people that fate decreed it to be so? What gives you the right to decide what someone's fate is? You're not a deity, you're just some jerk who isn't even willing to admit that the reason he went after his cousin was simply for revenge. That apparently finally did the trick, and an enraged Niji finally lunged forward to attack. Good, if he could get him more towards the right and keep him distracted while doing so. Now for the kicker. Hinata wasn't the failure, you are. He said, goading his opponent even closer to the trap he'd set up. Hinata worked hard to change herself and wouldn't stay down even after she was defeated. You on the other hand, you don't even try to change things or yourself and go crying about fate when things don't go your way. I'm willing to bet that after this match is over, you're going to go on and on about how it was your fate to lose to a stronger opponent while plotting to take me out the moment you are given the opportunity to legally do so in revenge. You're pathetic. Bingo. There went Niji, there went the trap, and he didn't even have to pull out any of his toads to win. Pity. He'd been looking forward to seeing the expression on that guy's face when he summoned a toad the size of his bedroom. Ah well, he could always summon one later, and if that jerk tried anything, he'd be getting a close and personal view of the interior of a toad's digestive tract. How does it feel to be beat by someone everyone used to call a loser? He asked a boy who was barely conscious and unable to rise, having practically been electrocuted by the trap he'd lured him into. Two and a half years ago, just about everyone would call me a loser and believe that I wouldn't amount to much if anything. I graduated the academy by the skin of my teeth and was only barely competent when I did so. I spent the next couple of years building myself up practically from scratch with the help of Tetsuo Sensei, and now, well. Watch you call a loser jerk, people do change, and chances are that the guy you constantly put down will end up kicking your ass in the end. Winner. Yuzumaki Naruto. The proctor said when Niji finally lost consciousness. Ayuga Hiashi watched as his twin son was carried off by medics. His Ashi had always been the better of the two of them. It had been his Ashi who had almost always won their sparring matches. It had been his Ashi who had produced a son. 
it had been his Ashi's child who had proven to be quite possibly the most powerful Hyuga in generations. His Ashi who'd been marked as inferior due to the timing of his rather unfortunate birth. He had failed his brother's son the way he always ended up failing the rest of his family, especially his Ashi. He hadn't known until it was far too late to do anything about it that the boy had harbored such hatred and resentment within him. He hadn't gotten close enough to notice, as looking at the boy was painful, since he was the spitting image of his father. The boy was a strong echo of the mirror image that had always been there until one day it wasn't, and he was forced to live in a world without his Ashi, because of his own ill-conceived actions. It was long past time that he should have a serious talk with the boy. When he did so, he would finally hand over a letter he should have given him long ago, but had selfishly held on to, because it had been the last thing his Ashi had given him before he died. From his seat in the competitor's box, Lee felt a pang of jealousy, as Niji was carried off the arena floor after having lost to someone named Yuzumaki Naruto that he vaguely remembered hearing about on occasion. That should have been his victory. Niji should have won so he could face him in front of everyone in the next round and prove that a genius of hard work could defeat a natural genius. He had trained so hard for the day he could finally defeat Niji. Today however, apparently wasn't that day. He would still be able to prove that a person could be a great shinobi with Tejutsu alone on this day however. He was up next and slated to face off against one of the sand genin, a puppeteer named Kenkuro. In order to win this match, he would have to fight both his opponent and the puppet, which undoubtedly had any number of hidden surprises. Since his match would be starting momentarily, he made his way down to the arena floor as the Yuzumaki boy made his way back up. He would fight him one day and see which of them proved superior. If what the boy had said in the arena was true, the Yuzumaki was quite possibly a genius of hard work like himself, and because of that, that would be a fight he could look forward to. Finally, after the arena had been cleared, he stood facing his opponent, or possibly his opponent's puppet, as the two had been known to switch out in front of the proctor. You got here because you got lucky. It won't take much to defeat you. His opponent said as they stood waiting for the match to start. The instant the proctor had announced the start of the match, he raced forward towards his opponent. He was going to make that Tsunin in need his words. He knew that such thoughts were decidedly unyouthful, but he wasn't really in a good enough mood to care at the moment, and he would apologize to Guy Sensei and make up for this lapse later. Now however, he was going to win. Elsewhere, Niji woke up to the sight of a plain white ceiling and the general fuzziness of painkillers. He could still feel the pain from the injuries that had been inflicted by that trap he'd stumbled into. Being forcefully pinned in place before being slightly roasted and electrocuted wasn't fun. Right now, he felt like he had an all-over sunburn, which, as any fair-skinned being who has made the mistake of living in sunny climes could tell you, was excruciating torture, despite the fact that it had not yet reached the truly painful stage. Thank God someone had come up with the idea of fireproofing shampoos and conditioners, otherwise his hair would have been worse than lightly singed, which would have been a disaster considering the number of years he'd spent growing it out, so it would be just like his father's. He hadn't missed the winces his uncle and his grandfather tried to hide whenever they encountered him, especially after he'd started tying his hair back like dear old dad used to. When he got out of here, he would make the Yuzumaki pay. He would. Damn it. The little bastard had been right. The instant the match was over, he'd started plotting revenge. Sakura honestly hadn't known what to expect from the boy who had almost handed Sasuke his ass in the academy hallway before the start of the exams over a month ago. As the boy had been older, in a completely different cycle, and not someone she encountered elsewhere in the village or from a family she was familiar with, she hadn't really known him from Adam. When she had questioned the boy's former classmates in order to gain information on him in order to form a strategy for dealing with him, if she somehow managed to win enough times to face him, and vice versa, the word that had come up most often was loser. She wasn't quite sure how accurate that assessment was considering. The boy's appearance and manner may have been overbright and disturbing to her sensibilities, but still, he had made it this far, and it couldn't have entirely been on the merit of his teammates, or strongest teammate rather. Hayuga Niji was last year's Rookie of the Year, and a seemingly insurmountable obstacle that she had been unable to come up with a plan for, which was just as well considering the fact that Naruto had already beaten him. Lee's opponent Kankuro was an unknown variable in this bout as well. She knew that the boy used puppets, but that was all she really knew about him, as there had been nobody to gain intelligence on him from. Should she find herself facing him, if through some miracle she'd passed that far, she'd find herself winging it. Unfortunately, improvising strategy on the fly with little to no information going in was not one of her strong suits. The fight opened with Rock Lee immediately charging at his opponent, which was generally considered to be a dumb move, but it actually worked for the boy, quite likely due to the element of surprise. The blow that sent the other boy flying also revealed that it had been the puppet rather than the person who had stood facing Lee at the beginning of the match. 
Be either that, or the Kankuro boy was a master of the Kawarimi to the point that it was both seal-less and unaccompanied by the chakra smoke that was usually present during such elementary techniques, much like Kakashi. Lee seemed to be somewhat confused as to who to go after at that point, since he had two dangerous and potentially deadly options, but decided to continue going after the puppet, apparently since if he followed that plan, he'd pretty much only be facing the puppet, rather than both the puppet and his opponent. After several attacks that nearly destroyed the puppet, there was a strange clicking noise that came from within the wooden construct as it changed shape, rearranging itself into a different form that revealed a wide array of weapon launchers. One of the launchers started releasing a shower of senbin that may have been poisoned, considering the fact that it was a common practice in Suna. Lee was fast, barely fast enough to dodge. All it would take would be one hit however. Lee. Take them off. Guy's voice boomed over the roar of the crowd. Following that cryptic bit of advice, Lee disengaged from his opponent and shot for the shelter of the trees that ringed the arena and started tugging on one of his leg warmers the instant he reached them. After hopping on one leg for a couple of seconds, the boy was obscured by some bushes, but after a loud thud, two loud thuds rather a green blur, shot back into the arena at an almost insanely high speed. Whatever it had been that Lee had been wearing had apparently slowed him down considerably. Instead of going after the puppet this time, Lee went after the one controlling it. Due to the spandex-clad boy's prodigious speed, the boy from Suna didn't have the time to evade before a barrage of blows rained down on him, courtesy of one Rock Lee. The puppet flew to his aid, but wasn't very effective in doing so, because Kankuro went down, thanks to a rather precise and very powerful kick to the head, which had been delivered shortly after Lee had dodged another volley of Senbin and had returned in the instant before the puppet could fire again. As the proctor announced Rock Lee's victory, she found herself amazed at how strong the boy was and lamenting the fact that he didn't look better. In the very short time she had known Lee, he had treated her better than Sasuke had over all the years she had known him. It was better to not think about that though. She was going to be Mrs. Acha. There was no way in hell that she'd lose to Ino in anything. She'd beaten the girl in battle and she would beat the girl in romance as well. The fact that Sasuke had not yet arrived was worrisome to her. If he missed his match, he would forfeit. Fortunately, he and Gara were last, so there was still a little time for him to get here. In another part of Konoha, Sasuke frantically sprinted through the streets while Kakashi followed behind him at a more sedate pace. He probably would have been at the arena on time if Kakashi hadn't picked a training area that was so far from the village. Since he wasn't paying as much attention to where he was going as he should have been, he tripped over a garbage can that had been blocking the alley he decided to use as a shortcut, hoping to get to the arena in time for his match at the very least. The instant he and the metal container collided, the contents of the can went flying everywhere, and an instant later, he landed in them. That's what happens when you rush things. Kakashi said lazily as he helped him pick some bits of orange peel off his clothes. I wouldn't have needed to rush things if you had woke me up on time. He snapped at the man as he slapped his hand away. As far as he was concerned, this was all Kakashi's fault. He stood up on his own, refusing all of the haddock's offers of aid, and started running again, cursing as he stepped into a puddle of God knows what that had been lying in the middle of the street he turned onto. Based on the smell, it couldn't have entirely been mud. In the medical wing of the arena, Niji looked down at the letter his uncle had given him. He had immediately recognized the handwriting on it from the notes his father used to leave behind for him before he went on missions. The scroll on which the letter he held had been written was well worn and appeared to have been opened often. Noting this, he remembered the slightly reluctant manner in which his uncle had handed it over, almost as if he hadn't wanted to give it to him, despite the fact that he was the one it had been addressed to. Reading the letter, he learned that his father had defied his fate the only way he could at that point. He had chosen the reason for his death rather than allow anyone else to chose it for him. His father hadn't died for the sake of protecting the main house from the trouble that had been caused by his brother's egregious blunder as he'd believed for so long, he had died for the sake of Kanoha, his brother, and the rest of his family, and went knowing that his brother had been willing to die rather than sacrifice him. Instead of honoring his father's sacrifice as he should have been doing, he had hated the very people his father had died to save and had savagely attacked the girl he'd once admired the most for being one of the sweetest and kindest people he'd ever known. He'd attacked the girl he'd once been happy to protect, not just because she was of the main house, but because she had been his friend as well. After his father's death, he'd spurned the love that Hinata had held for him as a member of her family and done everything he could to hurt her. Despite all of this however, she still kept trying to reach out to him. Naruto was right. He was a pathetic asshole. If Naruto was right about that, then there was a chance that he could be right about the possibility of him being able to change. He would have to test it and see who was right about that in the end. Shikamaru sighed. He just had to be given the worst opponent out of all of them. 
to tell the truth, he honestly hadn't even wanted to show up in the first place, since he'd planned on giving up, but knew that he'd never hear the end of it if he skipped, and that would be more bothersome than simply turning up and getting it over with. He had run a variety of scenarios through his head over the last month, and had come to the conclusion that with the Aburum, it would end in a double knockout at best, since he didn't want to outright kill the boy over a simple competition, especially since there would be numerous opportunities for promotion down the line. The reason he found this match to be so troublesome was because the other boy's swarm was a near-perfect counter to his Kajimane technique. He could possibly get a fatal or in this case winning blow in before Shino's swarm took him out, but that would render him unable to compete in the next round, which would more than likely be against the Suna girl Tamari. Better Shino than him in that situation, as far as he was concerned. Defeating Tamari would be tricky and time-consuming, and he didn't want to go through the trouble of doing so. When the proctor called out that it was his turn, he opened his mouth to say he gave up only to find himself being picked up by two of his fellow competitors and thrown into the arena. I'm sorry about this, but Eno paid me, and it would be dishonorable not to fulfill my end of the bargain. Rock Lee called down. You got paid Yuzumaki Naruto, Rock Lee's partner in crime said. Great. If he quit now, he'd have to go through the work of getting back into the contestant's box for nothing. Since he was already here, he may as well go ahead and get it over with. The fight started and went pretty much how he figured it would go. He quickly caught Shino with his Kajimane Jutsu, and Shino quickly caught him with his swarm of Kakechu. Once that was over with, he quit before he was drained too much by the creatures. Now that that was over, he could rest until this bothersome tournament was over and it was time to go home. Well, well, look who finally showed up. One of the two guards at the entrance to the arena said. It's a good thing too, since I think there would be a riot if you were disqualified before your match took place, since many people have traveled a long way to see the last Ichiha fight. You're up next since the battle between the Haruno girl and that girl from Suna just started. The other guard said as he waved the last Ichiha and his sensei inside with a hand which held a portable radio on which an announcer's voice could be heard. Sasuke groaned as he swiftly made his way to the competitor's box, since he knew that he'd have absolutely no time to prepare for his upcoming fight. No matter how much Sakura had improved, the Suna girl would swiftly beat her, and since that was the case, there was no time to shower and change in order to get rid of the scent of the trash he'd landed in or whatever the heck had been in the puddle he'd splashed through on the way here. Fortunately, his clothes were of a dark enough color and in a good enough condition that he'd look okay from a distance. When he reached the balcony that overlooked the arena, it had been in time to see a slightly battered-looking Sakura bat a fan out of the Suna Windmistress's hand and launch herself into a pitched battle, apparently trying to negate the other girl's advantage by engaging in close quarters fighting. While a somewhat brilliant strategy, it was obvious that Sakura was going to lose, and lose she did, but she put up one hell of a fight as she did so, making the older and stronger girl pay dearly for her victory. The pink-haired girl that had followed him everywhere begging for attention fought like a cornered animal. Along with the standard academy to jutsu and a style she'd picked up from that boy's former teammate, the girl had apparently learned several dirty tricks. Throwing dirt into an opponent's eyes was probably the oldest trick in the book, but it was highly effective when it succeeded. It failed in this instance however, as the Suna girl had been able to dodge, apparently taught from infancy, how to avoid such attacks, since she lived in the middle of a desert near an area that was almost nothing but sand. That wasn't the only dirty trick in the Haruno girl's arsenal, and it was apparent that Sakura had gotten her nails sharpened the last time she'd gone in for a manicure, if the scratches she gave the other girl were any indication. After watching the fight for a while, he could see that the reason Sakura had gotten so many blows in while not taking nearly the amount of damage she should have was because the girl was using a very subtle jinjutsu that shifted her opponent's perspective slightly. Lows that would normally have hit vital areas were just a little bit off, and there were a few near misses where there should have been hits. The other girl had not yet discovered the jinjutsu by the time he'd realized it was in place and therefore hadn't started to compensate for it. The Haruno's choice of jinjutsu was a rather good one because something more obvious would have immediately been spotted and dispelled. This one however gave Sakura a slight edge since it was far more difficult to notice, especially when one is focused on fending off one's opponent. Sakura had rather clearly improved over the last month or so, but she was still annoying however. After putting on a surprisingly good show, Sakura eventually lost, as it had been obvious she would do from the start. Her opponent had been trained in both close quarter and ranged combat and had been older, larger, and had a few years more experience. Amazingly enough, it had come close a couple of times and Sakura had been able to hold her own for a while, damaging her opponent severely at one point, but she still lost. When the fight was over, the crowds cheered as the medics carried Sakura out of the arena and towards the infirmary. It was now his turn. He jumped into the arena, ignoring the comments of what the hell did Sasuke roll around in. 
And he could have stopped a shower at the very least if he was going to show up as late as he did. From the other competitors. As soon as he was in the arena, he stood in front of the proctor waiting as his opponent took the long way around, going down the stairs instead of over the railing. It was finally time. After a hellish month of hard work, he would finally show everyone the Tromide of the Acha. Ashigaki Kissum was having a very good day. Earlier that morning, he and Itachi had managed to score a free tent. This had been an especially good bonus because their last tent had become more patches than tent over the last few years, and the Akatsuki didn't have a budget for camping supplies, thanks to Kakuzu's penny-pinching ways. They had just gotten off one of the money missions they occasionally had to take to fund the Akatsuki's other activities, and were headed back to aim with the pay. To make the day even better, Itachi had managed to scrounge up a radio from somewhere, which was excellent, considering the fact that today, the Kanoha Tigers would be facing off against the Fire Country Lions in the Kanoha Arena. Competitive ninjutsu was always good for a laugh, and since there weren't any particularly pressing matters, he and Itachi could sit for a couple hours chilling and listening to the game. The day was a particularly good day for such things, since the sun was shining, there was a light breeze coming in off the ocean from the east, and he'd managed to get his hands on a case of beer recently, which he had stuck in the nearby stream to cool. Finally, after a few minutes of fiddling with the radio, it was on Fire Country International. I regret to inform you that the game between the Tigers and the Lions won't be taking place today. Our loyal listeners will be getting a special treat instead, as the reason for the cancellation was due to the third phase of the Chunin exams. Change it. He said. He wasn't exactly in the mood to hear about a bunch of genin inexpertly wailing on each other in hopes of becoming Chunin. Dot the first match will be Hai Uganiji vs Yuzumaki Naruto, both of Konoha. The second match will be Kankuro of Suna vs Rock Lee of Konoha. The third match will be Aburam Shino vs Nara Shikamaru, both of Konoha. The fourth match will be Tamari of Suna vs Hirono Sakura of Konoha. The fifth match will be Gara of Suna vs Ichiha Sasuke of Konoha. No. I think I'll leave it here for a while. Itachi said, pulling back the hand that had been very slowly reaching for the radio's tuning knob, as the boy had apparently been listening for any familiar names before he flipped the station in search of something better, or at the very least more interesting. The hundred Ryo says that the Kaiubi Jinchuriki wins the first match. He said. No bet. Itachi replied. In the main town of Wave Conchery, which was the closest thing the small country had to a city, Inari sat in front of the old radio in the inn twitching in excitement as he waited for the first match of the exams to start. He and his grandpa who did carpentry work as well as heavy construction, had dropped by to fix one of the walls that had been destroyed a few days earlier, during a fight between a pair of genin from Karigakur, who had been escorting an exceedingly fat merchant. A few minutes earlier, someone had turned on the game between the lions and the tigers, and instead got a surprise announcement. Naruto would be competing in a tournament, and best of all, he was up first. He was up against some guy named Niji, but he was sure Naruto would win very quickly, since he was the most awesome ninja ever. As soon as the announcement of the reason for the cancellation of the Lions and Tigers match had been made, several people rushed out of the inn to get everyone they could find. There was no way in hell anyone was going to miss this. Odd as we wait for Proctor Shiranui Genma to announce the start of the first match, a message is coming in over the radio network from the former Whirlpool Citizens Alliance in the Nation of Wave, wishing Yuzumaki Naruto luck and that everyone they will be rooting for him. For those who don't know, the Yuzumaki were a prominent clan in the former ninja village of Yuzushi Agakur, which had once been Konoha's closest ally. Inari grinned as he listened to the message. He knew exactly who sent it, since there was currently only one certified radio operator in Wave, and he was a jack of all trades, including bridge building. In Kurigakur, Haku turned on the radio, hoping to distract his Zabuza Sama from his anxiety over the impending arrival of his child or possibly even children. Zabuza hadn't been doing so well since May had made her announcement and had had a minor panic attack when he'd brought up the possibility of twins, since there was a history of that occurring in May Sama's family. A nice game would be exactly what Zabuza Sama needed to get his mind off things, and there usually could be one found at this hour on just about any station that wasn't devoted to music. Even the religious stations ran commentary on sports of various kinds. The Jashinist's commentary on the River Country Soccer Tournament that he'd tuned into last year had probably been the most disturbing thing he'd ever heard. With the goal of finding a nice relaxing game in mind, he casually flipped through the stations until... Happy the Frog and Friends has been cancelled in favor of the third phase of the Chunin exams, which are taking place in Kanoha this year. While we normally don't air Chunin exams in which Kurigakur Ninja aren't competing, we thought people might be interested since Yuzumaki Naruto who fought Mamachi's Abusa one-on-one -on -one and survived, is one of the genin competing. We now go live to Kanoha. And that's the signal. The first round of the third phase of the Chunin exams has officially started and it looks like Yuzumaki Naruto is making the first move of the fight. 
What move will he make, and how will Hai Uganiji who is favored to win counter it? He hoped that Zabuza Sama wouldn't order him to turn the radio off, it sounded like it would be an interesting fight, though he disagreed with the announcer from Kanoha on his assessment of Naruto's chances of victory. Naruto would be winning of course, not the Hai Uga he'd never heard of. In the popular Kiri Shinobi bar Mizuko and Kampachi nearly spit their drinks out when they heard what was on the radio, instead of the Tigers vs Lions game which the bartender usually played since he was a big Lions fan, despite the fact that such things could be marginally considered to be traitorous. God has formed a number of cage bunshin which have scattered. Several have moved to engage the Hayuga. What is it Kampachi? One of the other patrons asked. The Kaiubi Jinchiriki is competing in the exams. Kampachi replied. The one who ripped up those two Iwa Jen in a year and a half ago during the winter exams. The concerned bar patron asked. Yeah, Mizuko replied, after finishing his drink in record time. I figured he would have been promoted long before now myself, but apparently not. That Niji boy is going to be creamed. Mizuko's fellow drinking companion said. Creamed? Kampachi said. He'll be eviscerated. A hundred thousand Ryo says the Uzumaki wins it all. Mizuko said, slamming the money down on the counter. You're on. Kampachi said as he pulled the same number of bills out of his wallet and slammed them down next to Mizuko's money. The pair of Iwachunin groaned when they returned to camp. They had been hired to escort a merchant to Wave Country, which had recently reopened trade with the rest of the world after the collapse of Gato Corp, and had decided to hang around for a day or so to enjoy the nice if somewhat humid coastal weather before they trudged back home, which would be roasting hot right about now. They had decided to use some of their precious free time go fishing and had set out early that morning, forgetting rule number one, which had made something of a comeback in recent years in the process. It seemed that they weren't the only ninja in the country, as someone had expertly bypassed and disabled all their traps before making off with anything and everything they considered useful, including Kuratsu's toothbrush. Seeing as they needed those supplies, it looked like they would be spending their afternoon tromping around the island, looking for the thief or thieves, rather than relaxing as they'd hoped to do, and that was most definitely not how they had wanted to spend their day. Things would certainly be getting even worse by nightfall, as when they finally found their missing supplies, they would have to fight to get them back, and one or both of them would probably be nursing injuries on the way home, depending on the skill of their opponents. Grumbling about the indignity of it all, they set out in search of their missing property. After about half an hour, they found themselves at a camp near a stream that contained a very familiar tent. That is over. Yuzumaki Naruto expertly led Hai Uganiji into a trap which simultaneously burned and electrocuted him that the experts say they have not seen in decades. As our panel of experts are retired shinobi with more than a century and a half of experience combined between them, this is saying something. We will now go to the head of our expert panel, council member Yudatain Kaharu for a more detailed explanation. Hey. Kuratsu yelled as he approached the camp that was occupied by some soon-to-be-dead ninja. That's. Yes. A voice said as a head poked around the tent. A very familiar head, with a face that he and his companion had last seen in a bingo book, amongst the S-class entries. Thought that's a neat tent. Kuratsu continued, swallowing down the diatribe he'd had planned and putting the kibosh on the ass kicking that would obviously not be happening unless it was his ass that was being kicked. There was no way in hell he was going to be getting himself killed over some measly camping supplies. Me and my friend here lost ours, do you know where we could get another one? There's a camp about two miles in that direction that seems to be unattended. Hashigaki Kissam's camping buddy who was also another familiar face from amongst the Bingo Books S-class entries, said as he pointed in the opposite direction from their camp. Gee, thanks. Kuratsu said. We'll just be going now. With that, they both fled. Hopefully, they'd be a little luckier at the next camp over. The unofficial shinobi supply rule number one stated that any supplies left unattended were fair game. In another section of wave country, Sato and Ichiro walked back to their camp. They were so close, yet so far, as the place they really wanted to be was about a day's travel away. They had wanted to be part of the coming action today, but had been forced to remain behind and take missions, so things would look like business as usual, and Kanoha wouldn't become suspicious until it was far too late and soon as forces were breaking down their gates with their new allies. Part of business as usual included lingering for a day or so if they could swing it, as ninja weren't usually eager to hurry home to the extreme weather that would be waiting for them in the hottest parts of summer or coldest parts of winter, unless there was someone practically riding their asses. If they had tried to swing by Kanoha sometime today, it was possible that they would have arrived at the wrong time and aroused suspicions, ruining months of careful planning and obsessively rehearsed synchronized movements of which they hadn't been a part. They would be able to hear Suna and Odo's grand victory as it happened though, as Sato had thought to bring a radio with him. It's gone. Sato called out from the tent. What's gone? 
Ichiro asked. The radio and about half of our supplies. Sato called back. Hucking Iwa bastards. Ichiro snarled as he kicked a tree. He'd spotted a pair of Iwa Chunin casually fishing off the new bridge when he and his partner had gone into town for breakfast that morning. It was at that point that said Iwa bastards attempted to sneak up on their camp. They managed to overpower the pair after a struggle. Give back our radio. Sato snarled at his captive. We don't have it. One of the Iwa Nin said. We don't think you'll want to try getting it back either. The other Iwa Nin said as he struggled against Ichiro's grip. And why not? Ichiro asked. If those bastards had done something to the radio, they were dead. Same reason we didn't try taking our tent back. The first Iwa Nin replied. Hashigaki Kisum and Ichiha Itachi have it. Bullshit. Sato said as he punched his captive. You don't believe us? Come look for yourselves. Sato's captive replied. Though they didn't know exactly how, Ichiro and Sato found themselves sparing the lives of and dragging their captives two miles to a campsite that was set in a rather nice clearing next to a stream. Seated in front of a tent that looked like it had recently come from the Iowa Supply Warehouse, next to the missing radio, were a pair of men in black cloaks with red clouds on them. A pair of exceedingly familiar men with black cloaks with red clouds on them. Ichiro and Sato moved to dispel what had to be a Jinjutsu and found the men still sitting there listening to their radio. The black-haired one turned to look at them. Quiet. He said. My brother's up next. The Kashi watched as his student Sasuke stood facing Gara. Training Sasuke one-on-one -on -one for a month had been rather trying to his patience, especially since he had wanted to do other things at the time, namely train Naruto. The attitude problem alone had been enough to get on his nerves and make him want to strangle the Ichiha boy and bury him in a shallow unmarked grave. That boy never appreciated what was given to him. Probably because just about anything and everything was given to him if he indicated that he wanted it by people who either pitied him for being left alone in the world or sought a small amount of the power he would hold in the future. When something wasn't handed to him when he wanted it, Sasuke became upset and exceedingly jealous of anyone who had what he wanted. This character flaw hadn't entirely been because of the massacre though, as Sasuke had been the beloved younger son of the head of the Ichiha clan and as a result had been spoiled practically from infancy by his clan, especially his older brother. Despite his misgivings, he himself had given Sasuke something most precious and he was almost certain he would regret it in the future since he already was starting to because the boy hadn't appreciated it or the other training he had given him. Part of the responsibilities of being a teacher is passing things down to the next generation. He wanted to pass everything he knew down to Naruto, but there was one thing he knew that he unfortunately could not pass down to his sensei's son. In fact, Sasuke was the only member of the next generation that it could be passed down to considering the requirements. There was a good chance that Sasuke would not be his student or his concern for much longer, considering some of the better offers he had gotten for the boy from Jounin who were looking for an apprentice, but, as Sasuke's teacher for however long that he would be there was one thing he could teach the boy, and that was the Chidori, which he had. He'd had reservations about teaching the boy the technique, considering the anger problem the child had and his tendency for overkill, but the technique was too valuable to die with him the way the Horatian had died with Minato-sensei. Had there been more Ichiha however, he would have held out until he had found one who was worthy of learning his signature technique, one who had been more like Abito, one who would have truly appreciated what he'd been given and the hard work and sacrifice it had represented. That couldn't be though, because all that was left of that clan was a boy who had not appreciated what had been given to him, a boy who was like he had once been in many ways, but far more arrogant than he had ever been. At the very least, he'd had respect for his sensei since day one. Sasuke lacked even that. Hopefully, he wouldn't be seeing the Chidori during this battle, since he and Sasuke had gone over several methods the boy could use to get past the Gara boy's defenses, methods that had included a couple of lesser and less chakra-intensive lightning jutsu, but considering Sasuke's character, he knew that the boy would be trying it at least once. And would possibly lose the match because of the extensive amount of prep time it took. The match started with Sasuke making a few jabs at the potential unknown that was Gara of Suna. He had seen surveillance of Gara in action and knew that the sand moved on its own, crushing and tearing opponents and forming a protective barrier around the Suna Genin. What else it could do was uncertain. Lightning however was strong against Earth-type defenses, so this was a good match for Sasuke, who was of that affinity as well as fire. He felt Guy stiffen next to him when Sasuke really started to move, rather than merely poking the boy's defenses to see what would happen, trying to get around the sand that surrounded his opponent with speed after a minor lightning attack had failed. He knew exactly why. Guy had shown Lee's skills off to him at one point, hoping to impress him, and therefore had recognized Sasuke's new fighting style as a copy of what little of Lee's style he'd observed, sped up to Lee's true speed, rather than the weighted speed the boy had witnessed when Lee had almost handed him and later Chaoji their asses. 
He could tell that while Guy was impressed with Sasuke's skill, he wasn't happy. Guy had taught Lee his fighting style because he had selected the boy as his apprentice. To see another using it so casually, especially someone who wasn't his student, someone who hadn't spent so much as an hour learning under him. The Sharingan and its copying ability had fostered resentment wherever the Achiha and he himself went, so this was nothing new. Elsewhere in the stands, Tenten found her fists clenching as she watched while Sasuke practically disappeared as he tried to get through the other boy's sand barrier. That little bastard had ripped off Lee's moves. Sure, there were differences here and there, but the main part of it was something Lee had worked hard for day in and day out for and invested thousands of hours into. Unlike Lee, it repeatedly worked until he'd dropped and then worked some more to get where he was at had Ichiha had taken one look at Lee's fighting style, and the next thing anybody knew, he was copying Lee at top form. There was a roar of approval from the crowd as Sasuke launched his opponent into the air and kicked him before he landed. There was an even louder roar when Sasuke got within his opponent's sand defense and attacked with a weak Kraton. Jibashi. Tenten didn't join in. She now knew exactly why her father had called the Ichiha thief without any sort of admiration when he did so. Stealing from the enemy was acceptable, even admirable in many cases. Stealing from your comrades the way Sasuke had stolen from Lee and Gai Sensei was not. In the arena below, Gara called his sand back around him. The Achiha had driven him back and back and back. He had known when he had run into the boy during a self-guided tour of the village that he was someone who could validate his existence, and he'd been right. The Achiha was strong, and crushing him would make this entire trip worthwhile. Mother would be tasting the boy's blood soon. He knew that the others would be upset at him for jumping the gun slightly, but that was their problem. He had been prepping for this all day and would be doing it anyway, so what did a few minutes here or there matter? The Ichiha had been tricky, but as soon as he merged with Mother, the boy would be all out of tricks and his insides would be outside for all the world to see before Mother gobbled them up, along with the rest of this village. Kanoha would be Mother's playground and its residents her sacrifices, except for the Raymond stand owner Tuchi and his daughter, and maybe that blonde boy Naruto. In the cage box, Orochimaru barely refrained from licking his lips as he watched the Ichiha boy fight. That act of cowardice back in the forest had apparently been pragmatism, which was a useful trait to possess. Even without his seal giving the boy strength, he was strong. Sasuke was strong, and he was fast. He was what he wanted in a vessel, and during the confusion of the battle, Sasuke would be taken to become his. Had Sasuke not proven himself, he would have been taken to where he could be rather publicly and messily executed in order to lower morale amongst any survivors that might get ideas. As a weak Sharingan was worth less than no Sharingan, and there might have been a reason Fugaku had been distant towards his younger son, aside from the fact that he'd been unplanned. It wasn't like he couldn't get his hands on an unattached Sharingan and go through the Kakashi method a few times, but he'd prefer to have one he could turn off and didn't have to cover due to vanity, which was something of a failing of his that he'd yet to eliminate. As he watched the action in the arena, he bit back a groan of annoyance when he saw that Gara was starting to transform before the signal. The bloodthirsty brat was apparently far too eager for the battle to begin. Oh well, it wasn't as if it would ruin his plans or anything. Kanoha was as good as destroyed at the moment considering the fact that they were mostly unprepared for what was to come. Knowing that what would be coming next would be interesting to say the least, he turned his attention back to the fight. As Gara sat in his cocoon of sand, Sasuke made his way up the wall of the arena where he stood preparing something. This part of the fight was boring. He hated it when things weren't moving. As he was about to give the signal, if only to end the monotony since Gara's transformation would take a while, he heard a familiar chirping noise. Little Kakashi had taught him that jutsu. Well, it looked like things were going to get interesting. He would sit back and watch this. As the sound of birds rose to a crescendo, the Ichiha boy raced down the wall towards the sandball that contained the Ichibi's Jinchuriki, leaving a line of destruction behind him. Seeing as the Chidori could cut through steel, concrete and earth were nothing to it and didn't slow it down one iota. Practically the instant the boy started down the wall, his arm was through Gara's fear of protection, and based on the sounds coming from inside, he had gotten something, but had failed to kill Gara, who tried to hold his arm in, possibly in order to rip it off. Sasuke managed to free his arm, and a monster spike thing that could be a paw or a tail shot out of the hole that Sasuke had made in Gara's protective sphere and attacked the boy. Seeing the appendage, he waited for the rest of the transformation, but it didn't happen. The ball of sand disintegrated instead. It seemed that Sasuke had managed to tire Gara out and get him to use the chakra necessary for the transformation. Oh well. He'd deal with Gara later. Now, he'd be giving the signal. Without warning, he raced to the railing and launched the smoke canister that would cover his kidnapping of his former sensei, as well as signal the start of the invasion. Everything was now in motion. That was good. He hated it when things were still. Odd unexpected cloud of smoke in the cage box. And. And. Feathers. 
Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z. Wake up, stupid. Oh. Huh. What? There seems to be some sort of barrier on the roof above the cage box, and the Hokage and the Kazakiage are in the middle of it. Hokage Sama appears to be the Kazakiage's captive. One of the Anbu has moved to assist and is now rolling down the roof in flames. Bazuko groaned and slammed his head into the bar. Why? Why? Why had the Kazakiage decided to start a war now of all times? Thanks to his untimely assassination attempt, he was now out a hundred thousand Ryo, as the third phase had apparently been stopped before the tournament could be completed, and Yuzumaki Naruto had only won one match instead of all of them. Of all the times this could have happened. Bad luck man. One of the bar patrons said, a bar patron who was out some money as well, since the phase had ended in an invasion prior to the completion of the finals, which was a legitimate bet that someone who had bet that every Chunin exam had finally made a killing off of. Bad luck. Bad luck. That had been all his available money until his leg healed, and he was able to take missions again in six weeks. Thanks to that stupid Kazakiage, he was going to be forced to survive on field rations. Bad luck indeed. Odd is apparently gone after the Suna Genin who have taken the opportunity to make their escape. A small group of the other competitors have gone out a hole in the wall created by Mido Guy, presumably to assist in dealing with the invasion we are now receiving reports of from the Eastern Wall. As he listened to the surprisingly calm report given by the radio announcer who had remained at his post chronicling events as they took place, Haku found himself biting his nails, which was a nervous habit he rarely indulged in. He was several days travel away from his friend's village, and there was nothing he could do to aid Naruto, who had been responsible for his and Zabuza's new lease on life. Had Naruto not gotten the citizens of Wave and later the Hokage himself to spare them, they would have been long dead before Mei Sama had become Mizukage. He had little doubt that Naruto was amongst a small group of Konoha shinobi who had gone out to help save their village, as he wasn't the sort of coward who would hang back when others were in danger, and he hoped that he would make it out of this battle alive. The Jinchuriki brat will be fine. Zabuza Sama said, accurately guessing his fears as always, and trying to allay them, even though he seemed slightly uncertain himself. He smiled. He would trust in Zabuza Sama, and he would trust in Naruto. Naruto would make it through this, and knowing him, he would probably save the day while doing so. Apparently isn't the Kazakiage, but rather the missing Ninarachimaru, who is one of the legendary Sanin who had been the Hokage's students. Hokage-sama has engaged him in battle, starting off with a tile shuriken jutsu. The cheering of the Suna and the Iwanin who had stayed to listen to Sasuke's match had been silenced by a few well-placed kunai moments earlier, much to the surprise of one Hashigaki Kisum, who had never seen Itachi kill anyone he didn't feel he had to. He had told Kisum that it had been because they had been giving him a headache, but he suspected that Kisum knew otherwise. Despite his exile, he was still loyal to Konoha and his little brother. Both were in danger now, and there was nothing he could do about it, but sit and listen as the battle which was a day's journey from here unfolded. He would be praying that both Sasuke and his village survived. If one or the other fell in this battle, there would be hell to pay. He was usually a pacifist, but he had killed before and would kill again if anything happened to Sasuke. If Sasuke died, the rivers would run red with the blood of every last ninja from Suna, and the new village Odo and Arachimaru would be staked out for the Carrion Crows to feast upon. The bee continued. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in.